baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. 16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6.3-6. 6, 3 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. So we're going to talk about science, science of the Bible. And uh, I, I just want to say on your notes there, the word science is used twice in the King James Bible. The first time it was used uh, when Nebuchadnezzar chose to train choice young men. And one of the qualifications that they had to have was understanding science. That's the one time. The other time it's used in the New Testament when Paul warned, warned uh, Timothy and said, Beware of science falsely so called. Now, I, I'm in the process of... I've had three printings of my book, and I'm in the process now of making an e-book. And by the way, I have my book here, and out of the third printing, it's, there's about 100 left. Uh, but I'm in the process of revising, and I am, I'm not using this. This was the very first paragraph in the, in the book. But the reason why I'm not going to use it in a revised thing is because really the word science didn't mean what science means now. You know, when the but I still, I still think it's true that uh, understanding the science in the way we know it is good. And uh, I, I happen to have, some of you know me and some of you don't very well, but I happen to have a doctor of science degree in chemical engineering, and I taught chemistry at three different colleges and universities. So I think I know what a science is. I think I have an aptitude towards science, and I don't think it's a bad thing. And I also say that that falsely called science, which Paul warned about, uh, which maybe he didn't mean what we call science, but this teaching of evolution, many professing of error concerning the faith. I have, uh, I have here, I have here a, a debate. I don't know how many of you have seen this before, but I've had the privilege of doing some debates. This debate was in Tampa, Florida, at the University of South Florida. I debated against the chairman of the Board of the Atheists of Florida. I never had met him before. All I knew was his name was James Smith. And uh, I didn't know much about him except he was the chairman of the Atheist of Florida. And the debate was very similar to what I'm going to give you tonight. That was that ev my, the subject was evolution is not scientific. Evolution contradicts uh, scientific laws. Evolution is not a mathematical problem. So I gave my 30-minute presentation. I didn't uh, mention God, didn't mention the Bible, didn't mention church, just some shall we say, a scientific standpoint. This man got up, and his first words was, I was formerly a Pentecostal preacher. Five times he says that. And once the last time he says, and, and then I started believing in evolution. And he says, the next step after evolution is atheism. He holds up a bumper sticker, because I'm proud to be an atheist. So this was an example of somebody that I have known, whose faith was destroyed by this idea of evolution. So I think it's very, extremely, extremely important. Okay, so that you fill out the blank, understanding is the first blank, and opposition to falsely, science falsely so-called is the next blank. Okay, we're ready to move on. I've got some cords here, and i got to make sure I don't, I don't uh, tumble over the cord. I used to go left ways, now I've got to go right. I've got to learn a new trick tonight. Okay, uh, in the Another new trick for me would be to get my notes ahead of time, and I was going to get that pulpit thing down there, that, that uh, music stand. Could you get that for me? We talked about beforehand, and, and I forgot. Anyways, uh, while he's getting that, so I can set this on there, uh, let me just give some examples from, from the media. This was in the 
This was in the San Diego Union Tribune, what I'm going to show you right now. And uh, it was, a, just set it right up here, look closely, you could, about this height. Oh, okay, did that open up good? Can you open up about this height? Uh, this, uh, this, little, this was a, a quarter page ad. It says this, your cousin was three inches long with a weasel face and a hairless tail. It said, uh, quest back in time to meet this critter, critter and his rat-like friends and how man began. And this is what I want you to get. It was in an award, San, San Diego Union Tribune's award-winning science section. Award-winning science section on their uh, you know, CD called How Man Began. Well, I've seen my cousins. <laughs> Some of you know Barbara Hildebrand. She was the, the, the pastor. And, uh, she was my first she is my first cousin. I'm very proud of her. She doesn't look like she doesn't look like a weasel face and hair like cream. None of them. In fact, all my cousins seem to look a lot better than I do. I don't know exactly what happened, but uh, anyways, but award-winning science section. Then uh, here's something that came in the uh, Newsweek. It says that they they uh, they found a. Uh, they said the title is uh, scientists filling in a piece of the evolutionary puzzle, they found a fingernail, a bone that was smaller than a fingernail, and they said, scientists believe, and by the way, evolution is something you believe, they have no evidence for. Scientists believe the bone once belonged to a small primate 45 million years ago. They found it in a quarry in China, and uh, they say that these uh, primates migrated from Asia to Africa, where they evolved into baboons, chimps, and people. The human story belongs, in, begins in Africa. There's no doubt about that. Well, I have some doubts about that. Okay. This here is Time Magazine. Uh, Time Magazine, uh, the cover. It said, How Apes Became Human. And it says, what a new discovery tells scientists about how our oldest ancestors stood on two legs and made an evolutionary leap. I'm telling you, kids are bomb. people in the public are bombarded with this. I don't know how the public, the papers are here in Kenai, but San Diego, most places I've been, are just bombarding them with evolutionary thought. I could spend a lot of time on it. But the point I'm making that all of these things is science says this. Is this loud enough where you can hear? Because I'm sometimes, that's why I like this lapel mic, because I, last time I'm speaking this kind of mic, I forget and drop it down. Okay. Okay. So, uh, anyways, all those ads and many other things always tell you that's like scientific fact, or science says this, or science proves that. Well, let's, Let's decide, or let's determine what really is the science. Now, I'm not going to bore you with a long dictionary definition, but I'm going to give you a few key words in the definition of the science. First of all, if it's scientific, it's something you should be able to observe. I have a picture here of a chemist, and he's looking into a microscope, looking at something. Uh, I taught, as I mentioned, chemistry at McAllister, Wisconsin State University, San Diego State University, uh, not San Diego, San Joaquin Delta College. And I would spend almost the most, the first semester, on uh, you know, teaching chemistry, and, and one of the experiments that I would show them and they would do is, if you had a solution, a colorless a solution of sodium chloride, uh, for example, uh, that's ordinary table salt, if you had a salt solution here and looked at it, it would look just like water, colorless, odorless. If you had another solution of silver nitrate, colorless and odorless, and you mix them together, you will immediately observe what? I see the valedictorian or whatever is nodding their head. What happens? And what form? Silver nitrate and sodium chloride. A white precipitate called silver chloride. 
you would be able to observe that with your eyes. Uh, some chemicals you mix together, and you can smell, you know, an odor given off, a gas, like, you know, hydrogen sulfide or something like that. Uh, some chemicals you uh, mix together, like, for example, if you were taking quantitative analysis in chemistry, when you try to determine the strength of an acid or a base, you put in an indicator, which you call phenolphthalein. When it reaches the end, time, end point, the color is supposed to immediately all turn pink. Just at the point at the end. You can observe that, the color change. Some chemicals you mix together, you can hear an explosion. Every chemistry instructor hopes that never happens, you know, in, in their labs. But uh, you, you can So what I'm saying is, either with your senses, your eyes, your nose, your ears, uh, or taste even, because I don't recommend that, uh, you know, you, you can observe it. And sometimes you can't observe it with your senses, but you can with instruments to determine, for example, change in connectivity. So I really want you to get this. The first thing about a science is that it is observable. There's something you can observe. Second thing, if it's scientific, is that you ought to be able to perform some kind of experiment, such as some that I described just then. The third thing is, if I discover something in the San Diego area, you ought to be able here in Kenai or Sterling, if you have the same equipment, you ought to be able to repeat it and verify it. So if you can't observe it, if you can't perform an experiment on it, if you can't repeat it, you can't verify it, then don't call it scientific. Okay, let's talk about the let's talk about the theory of evolution. Now, the theory of evolution is basically this that somehow in distant past, lifeless particles like Protons, neutrons, electrons came together to form atoms, and then they formed more complex chemicals, the elements, and then the complex chemicals, the molecules, and the simple living systems, and then eventually man. Uh, pictorially, it looks like this. It looks like this. Somebody says, from goo to you, from particles to man. That's the same basic theory of evolution. That this all happens without any external force, without any designer, without creator, that somehow particles evolve into man. Let me ask the question. This is very vital. Has that ever been observed? Has that ever been an experiment performed where somebody mixed some particles together and made man or even life? Has anybody ever repeated it or verified it? So this idea that has been brainwashed on the public, you know, many, many states, I don't know about Alaska, but many states, you can't teach creation, or they say you can't because that's religion, but you can teach evolution because it's science. I got, I learned a new word, brother. Uh, it's a new word, a word I've used a long time, I didn't know it was a dictionary, I looked up, it's called hogwash. Uh, that's in the dictionary, okay. Evolution, to say evolution is scientific, is hogwash. It's, when they call it science, it's falsely called science because it's not observable, it's not repeatable, no experiments performed on it, not verifiable. Okay. Now, uh, there are steps in the scientific method. The steps in the scientific method are the following. First of all, you have a problem. And I'm going to call on some that I don't know here and see if they can help me. Let's, uh, let's take, uh, well, this young man there, he's really paying attention good right here. Yeah, he's a pencil in his hand, he's taking notes. I like to see young, young men here. What is your name? Byron? Byron? You're pretty tall, Byron. How tall are you? Six foot, how old are you? Fifteen. Man, you may go taller, yeah. Okay. Is B Byron? Like Byron Nelson, the golfer? Okay. 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 Byron, I'm going to ask you a question. I've got the microphone here, so you may have to talk loudly. I have three kinds of balls here. Would you identify what the ball is? Uh, my 
Golf ball? It was color. Yeah. Pink, okay. I have another ball here. Do you know what that is? A ping pong ball. Pink ball, color? Uh, yellow. Yellow. I have another ball here. It's white, isn't it? What kind is that? Uh, Wiffle ball. Yeah. I was in Chile. They didn't have a slash to do what that was. Okay. Now, <laughs> the problem, Brian, that we're going to have is I'm going to ask you, when I tell you, I'm going to ask you to drop these balls. And uh, I hope they could see it. We probably could use a judge. How about the one boy there? Could you, you want to help me? You want to, yell, you want to be a judge? Come up here, okay? Now, what you need to do is get down, down real low. Get down real low. Now, it's probably the first time you've been on your knees today. That's good. See, that's a good position. Okay, that's good. You may have to get lower yet. Okay, let's see it. Now, what I'm going to have him do is I'm going to have him drop these three at the same time. And I want to say that's very difficult. Really, it's very difficult to be coordinated to do that. But we'll see. And then we want to know which is going to hit first. That's the problem. Now, don't do it yet, Brian. But how many, what, what do you think? Anybody got an idea which to hit first? Uh, we're not going to let that valid Victorian do it. Or, or think we're gonna, and so, huh? Oh, well, well uh, by the way, Brian, which of those balls is the heaviest? Yeah, uh, ball. Which one's the smoothest? Yeah, yeah, which one has holes in it so air can flow through? Yeah, okay, now when you drop those, which one of those three are going to hit first? Anybody want to? Somebody said a golf ball. Who said a golf ball? Okay. Somebody else. And they got it. The golf ball. Okay, anybody else? I see the, I see the, the girl shaking her head back there. What do you think? I'll hit the same time. Okay, somebody else. How about the ping pong ball smoother? How about the wiffle ball has air, you know, air can flow through it. Well, anyways, these are four hypotheses. That's the next step. It's an educated guess. Now, if you all said that it wouldn't fall at all, I'd have a little question about that. How educated? <laughs> or if you all said it was going to go up, up, I'd have a little problem. Okay, so that's the hypothesis. Now, the science, the, we solve problems lots of ways. One way we could vote here, you know. And if you voted, I, I don't want to, to take time, if you voted, it would be the majority win. And usually, in most churches, the majority say that the golf balls can hit first. So, problem solved. We voted. Majority win. Well, that's not the scientific method. Scientific method has this, has controlled experimentation. Now, Brian, what was your name? Jaron, J A R O N. Okay, yeah. I got a grandson named Jaron. It's not stuff. Like okay, you want to hold up high, guys? Are you ready? Are you watching? Are you a low enough? You may have to get lower yet. You got to see what's in here. Okay, you watching? Okay, drop them. You didn't let it go all at the same time, did you? Like it's very difficult. Okay, now that's that's good. At least you, you did. That didn't prove anything because it's. Very difficult to release those right at the same time. Maybe we should have a kind of some kind of contraption. But let me just tell you, I don't care whether you know which one's going to fall first. I just want you to know that the second step is an experiment. You're a controlled experiment, and that's very hard. what you have to do is you have to release them all at the same time. And that's very difficult to do. That's not his fault because most of us just aren't for it. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Jared. Appreciate your help. Okay. Now, I just wanted to illustrate that, and then, and then, of course, the second thing, if it's scientific, you ought to be able to repeat it and verify it. So you all ought to be able to go home with a step ladder and have your wife there on the ground <laughs> observing or, or whatever, and check, you know, check it out and so forth, and then, and then, of course, we really probably should, you know, we probably, you know, if you're really scientific, we'd measure the barometric pressure, we'd take the mass of the ball, we'd say how distance it fell, we time it, we do a whole lot of stuff. But that's not the purpose tonight. Now, I wanted to say there's methods of solving problems. One is the democratic method to vote. And I want to say that that many times people vote wrong. Okay? Uh, there's the appeal to higher authority. What did Aristotle have to say? He, said, he was thought to be a, a, a thinker for, what, thousands of years. And he said the heaviest one would fall first. So that's what everybody accepted. If Aristotle said it, you know, that's all the end. But Galileo did something different. You know, Galileo took two different balls, a leader, power, pizza, 
had another guy below and found that they fell at the same time, as the girl in the back was, was saying. Okay, now, other types of problems we solve, uh, for example, political problems. Again, we don't solve that scientifically, do we? Okay, but you sometimes, you sometimes vote moral questions. I talked about now some types of problems. We all have problems. All of us have problems, don't we? If there's anybody here who said they have, never have had a problem, I would say you've got a problem with honesty. <laughs> okay? Okay, so, so we all have problems. So some, there's different methods. Okay. Now, I want to say moral questions. We also shouldn't solve scientific. We don't experiment on some things. Right? That's right. Yeah. Direction questions. We don't, shouldn't experiment. You know, like, uh, should I join the military? Which branch should I join? Well, we'll experiment. We'll try the Navy for three years, and the Army for three years, and the Marines for three years, and the Air Force for three years. It'd be a military cuckoo, wouldn't you? Okay, so we don't do those things. And I want to say questions about the past. You do not solve that scientifically. For example, who was the first president of the United States? George Washington, who said that? He said that. And then back there, did you observe George as president? Can you experiment with George? No, really. Can you, can you repeat his presidency? Well, see, you cannot solve questions about the past scientifically. And that's what evolution tries to do, and they try to call it science, and it's outside the realm of science. Now, I want to just say, I want to just say something here and just take a minute to hear. I have heard, I have heard Pentecostals would say, no, I don't believe in evolution because it's just a theory. You ever heard that? Ever heard anybody say, I don't believe in evolution, it's a theory. Well, my problem is when I hear something like that, it's, I doubt whether they know what a theory is. There's a difference between a theory and a law. For example, when Brian dropped these balls, you observed a what? A law of gravity. I don't know how many countries I have dropped these balls in, but they always go down. Always. You can tell by the paint chipped off that it's been dropped, you know, a lot of times. This was not the first time you observed the law of gravity. I won't ask who, but some of you took a shower this morning. And the water went down the drain. Thank God it went down the drain. It didn't come up with the drain. Okay, that's the law of gravity. That's the law. You all have observed it. But tell me why? Why is the earth why is the earth attracted to the ball? Why is there a force that pulls the ball to the earth? This is one of the most important laws of science, but no one has ever come up with a theory that explains it. Now, he's got one. He'll be the first one. What is explained? What causes the ball to be attracted? No, well, that's gravity. But what causes gravity? What causes there to be force between? Right? Well, what I'm saying is, no, no one, I mean, I keep trying, let's keep trying, but you'll find that nobody has ever explained why. An explanation, a law is what you observe, an explanation is why, it's an explanation. Now somebody may come up with a theory, but <laughs> as of what I read just recently, so nobody still has ever come up with a theory to explain it. Now that does not mean all theories are bad. For example, if I took this piece of aluminum here, and I tore a piece off, and I took this piece of aluminum here and I tore it in half again and I don't want to make a mess but let's say I just keep tearing and tearing and tearing. And supposing I was able to tear that into the smallest particle of aluminum that has the properties of aluminum. What's that called? The smallest particle of aluminum that has the properties of aluminum. An atom. Who said that? All right. Have you ever seen an atom? No. I have either. But yet I spent, I spent almost a whole semester teaching the atomic theory and chemistry 
about how that this atom has a nucleus of protons and neutrons. It has electrons. And, and I've never seen a proton. I've never seen a proton, uh, electron. I've never seen a neutron. I've never seen an atom. And yet I would still teach it because the atomic theory is the best explanation as to why matter behaves the way it does. Okay, now, when it comes to how the universe originates, we really have two theories. One theory is God was involved, and the other theory was God was not involved. The theory that God was involved is the creation theory. Nothing wrong with the word theory. It's an explanation of what? The evolution idea that particles evolved to man, that's the evolution theory. That's a theory, but a bad one. And I will show you a number of reasons tonight why it's a poor, a poor one. Okay, let's move on. A law... In relationship, invariable, and safe conditions, a theory is an explanation of how or why. Okay, let's uh, move on. Uh, oh, well, this is this one here. I don't want to don't want to stop. Origin questions cannot be solved scientifically. Origin questions is like how did the universe begin? How did the Earth begin? Who was the first man? What did the first man look like? You can't solve those questions scientifically because of the fact that you can't observe the origin of the Earth. You can't prove an experiment. You can't repeat it. You can't verify it. Now let's let's. Uh, this uh, it turns out there's a lot of people working here today, and this may not work. Is there anybody here who both your biological Father and mother are here. Your biological father and mother are here. Is there anybody? Kimberly. Kimberly. Okay. Kimberly. Yeah. Both. Are. Okay. Let's ask. Let's ask Kimberly a question. A question about her origins. Now we're not going to embarrass Kimberly, but we're going to ask her. Kimberly, when were you born? June 10th, 1973. How do you know? Uh, because my mother told me. Your mother told you, huh? Okay. And her birth certificate. So she gave two two methods. June, what was it? June, June 10th, 1973. Okay. So she gave two methods. One was a birth certificate. If you go apply for a passport, they probably will ask for your birth certificate. Now, I just want to say that that's what we call reliable history. At least the government considers that reliable history. We have some people who forge it. <laughs> they get off the that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, that just came to me. Okay, but I want to say that doesn't always work because uh, I remember teaching at Wisconsin State University and I tried to get to know the students and I had one, his name was Sunday Iko from Nigeria. I just said, Sunday, I said, how old are you? He said, I don't know. <laughs> I was puzzled. I said, well, when were you born Sunday? He said, I don't know, except I was told it was on a Sunday. In that part of Nigeria, in that time, probably the time frame where he was born, maybe in the late 40s or something, they didn't have birth certificates. You know, in, in, in there. So that is what... The other idea that she proposed was to ask her parents, and uh, which one of the parents should we ask, Brother Churchill or Sister Churchill? <laughs> Sister Churchill, isn't your pastor honest? Well, he got poor memory. I was going to say maybe he was fishing that day. Okay, okay, but. Why I agree with all of you, I agree with all of you, is because I think the one we should ask, and Kim said that also, ask her mother. So when was when was Kim born? How do you know? Were you there? <laughs> now I want to tell you this is this is significant. If you get nothing else out of this, the way to answer origin questions, like how did the universe begin, how did the earth begin, how did man begin, is ask the one who was there. 
I'm going to repeat that. The way you answer origin questions is you ask the one who was there. Who was there? Who was there? He stretched forth the heavens alone. There was no one else there. He was there. Praise God. Thank God. And I'm so glad that he inspired holy men of old. And they wrote as he breathed upon them the truth. The reliable history, better than a birth certificate, is in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Woo! I get excited just talking about it. Praise God. And this is foundational. But really, it is foundational. And I may say it was lying later, I'm getting off it. What you do with Genesis, even what you do with Genesis 1 1. Even if you do, if you just do Genesis 1, if you just know four, four words, in the beginning, God. And if you're a good student, if you can remember five words, in the beginning, God created. And if you do better yet, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Oh, hallelujah. That's the way you solve this question. So when somebody tells you, well, the earth was 4.6 billion years, I don't think that you're smart out, but in your mind, or maybe you'd ask God, how, how, how do you know? Were you there? Isn't that what God asked Job? Were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Praise God. That's the way you solve it. You can't solve it scientifically because you can't perform an experiment on the origin of the earth. Amen. No science outside the realm of science. I'm going to say true science does not contradict the Word of God. Evolution contradicts both the Bible and scientific law. Then we're going to get to this. Uh, perhaps it's all science fiction. Uh, Sharon, were you there when David Kent was a student at, at uh, CLC? No, okay. Well, I just want to say... In Bible college work, the greatest thrill I have is hearing from former students or seeing former students. And I want to say it's a joy to see you two and Sharon. And, and I'm hoping that maybe on this trip I can see Sarah and Andrew. And I don't want to leave anybody else. But to get an email like this was very rewarding. David Kent uh, was reading my book. This is a plug for my book, okay? Uh, he was reading the book, and, and I actually have his email in, in uh, word by word, but I'll just go, go to the gist, gist of it. It was in the book where I was discussing, discussing the fact that the fish and the seas that pass through the paths of the seas. This is Psalms 8.8. 8. Okay. He was, uh, David Kent left uh, Bible college, and he and his wife, and they became... Uh, aim workers in the Marshall Islands. He said, he emailed me, and I give a whole gist of it, but just said that this is the thing content. He said that the people of the Marshall Islands are excellent at making canoes in Salem. They plot the waves and the currents of the sea with stick charts. And every year they do a race to determine between the islands which are the best seamen and shipbuilders. And all the contestants start to cross the ocean. But the captain of the Marshall Islands, his boat, he knew something about the currents and the paths of the sea. So whereas they all started out at the same time, you know, going away from the island, it wasn't long before they, they got out a little ways, and the other contestants kept going in a straight line toward the island of the destination. But the Marshall East people, they went in almost an opposite direction. In fact, there was so much in opposite direction they holler, you're going the wrong way! And they holler back, wait and see! Well, when they got to the place, they got the oceanic current that would take them to the island of destination, they turned into it. And you know what happened? They got there 24 hours ahead of the other contestants, racers, got a good night's sleep on the beach, and waited the next day for the other contestants to arrive. You know, uh, the psalmist wrote this like a thousand years before Christ, but this was not discovered until the mid-1800s, and it saved people sailing from Europe to North America some three weeks in time because of that. 
God knew about it 2,800 years before. And I went to Marceline, I found out, I don't know. Okay. Now, why is it important to believe the Genesis account? I can't think of anybody who could answer this question better than the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you cannot believe the words of Moses, how will you believe my words? Powerful, isn't it? Who is the writer? Who is the writer of Genesis? Moses. And he said, if you can't believe the words of Moses, how will you believe my words? So what have they done in the school systems of the United States of America for the last, oh, 75, 80 years? They have pumped in the school kids that, no, the Bible's not right. What happened was 13 to 15 billion years ago, an explosion, the Big Bang occurred, formed the orderly universe, formed the orderly solar system, formed 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth, eventually 1 to 3 million years ago man evolved, and they've pumped this into kids, and they've destroyed their faith in the Word of God, and if you destroy your faith in the Genesis account, then Jesus says, how are you going to believe it when I say to you, unless you're born of the water and the Spirit, you cannot be saved. How are you going to believe it when I say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? Hey, this is not just a religion. Jesus is the way. He's the door. He is the way, the truth, and the life. But they destroyed this Genesis account that Jesus said, how are you going to believe it? When I say, unless you repent, you're going to all likewise perish. And I saw the other words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, that's why I'm traveling. Man, I'm traveling a lot of places. Lord willing, I'll be going to Argentina next year and a lot of places, you know, and, then the universe wants to come again down there and so forth. And then the Uganda, I've been to a lot of places, teachers, because all of the world they need this. And we found it so. Okay, let's move on. Importance of Genesis 1. What you do with the Bible, as I said, depends on what you do with the first sentence of Genesis. And if you can believe that, you can believe everything that follows. If you can't believe that, you won't. Amen. And if you reject it, as I said, that statement, the rest of the Bible will be suspect. Okay, now, hurrying up. I want to give you three tonight, three scientific laws that evolution contradicts. It's not only not scientific, it contradicts scientific laws. The first one is the law of biogenesis. Big word, biogenesis. Genesis is beginning, bio, biology, life. So the law of biogenesis deals with life. Where does life come from? The law of biogenesis says life comes only from other life. That's where life comes from. The reason Kim's alive is because Brother and Sister Churchill were alive. They would have never had them if they were dead. <laughs> okay, life comes only from other life. Evolutionary theory, though, proposed, as we showed the pictorial, Particles, lifeless particles, combine to form amino acids, proteins, and eventually living cells. Do you see the contradiction? Evolution says life came from non-life. Scientific law says life comes only from other life. The idea of spontaneous generation of life from non-life is not scientific. It's never been observed, repeated, verified, and so forth. I only know of three exceptions. I only know of three cases where non-living things come to life. Just three. And you may know some more. The only ones I know of are Pinocchio, the gingerbread man, and Frosty the snowman. That's the only three I know. Okay. Now, just like I can hear by your laugh, you don't believe it, I don't believe it either. And really, whether scientists believe in God or not, they don't believe these are, they know these are fairy tales. Okay. So there are actually, I, and truthfully, I know of no exceptions. There's no exceptions to the law of biogenesis. Life comes only from other life. Mixing some ammonia and water and uh, 
uh, methane to get a passing electric, electric spark uh, through it. Uh, as I try to use Yuri's experiment, they never produce light, but I could, in my book, there's still a lot of problems with that experiment. How close have they come to creating life? If I, if I had come, come from the, uh, the airport, you met me at the airport there, and, and I said, before we get further, brother, uh, Churchill, I have a suitcase here. I have three or four bricks here. I want to show you, brother, brother uh, Churchill, I've just about completed rebuilding the Twin Towers in New York City. See this? The evidence? Three or four bricks. What do you think you would have done? <laughs> you don't laugh. You don't laugh. <laughs> I think you would have. I think you might have even suggested, well, I can pay you a fair back. <laughs> or, or I think we'll cancel these meetings or something like that. But I want to say three or four bricks is closer to rebuilding the Twin Towers, then they've come to creating life. They are not close at all. Okay. Oh, second law. Law of kind. I get this terminology from the Bible. You know, scientists may criticize this, but it's it's there. They may call it fixity of species or some other term, but the law of kinds is good enough for me. Okay. The Bible says that every living creature creates after his life. Cattle, creeping things, and beasts. After his kind. After his kind. Ten times. Ten times in the book of Genesis chapter 1, that phrase is after his kind. Now, Sister Pratt had, I don't want to call it, Sister Denny, forgive me. You had Brother Seagrave Ginger for homiletics. And I probably probably talked to you. I hadn't taken his class. He, he knew a whole lot more about homiletics than I'll ever know. But but when something's repeated, there's significance. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes the Bible doesn't just say Abraham. It says Abraham, Abraham. Or Martha, Martha. You know, there's no sense. Some of the times he repeats it for significance. Have you ever considered uh, Galatians 1, 8, 9? Though we are an angel from heaven, preaching of the gospel of this, will be cursed. And what's verse 9 say? Same thing, practically. Actually, John 3, 3 and 3, 5. Except the man be born again. He can't enter the kingdom. Except the man is born of the water and spirit. But with something ten times repeated in one chapter, wow, I think the Lord's going to get something through our heads. That's foundational. Okay. Now, I want to say that applies to both the plant and the animal kingdom. For example, let's say, pick on these, on these boys again. I'm going to pick on these girls, so these young ladies. If you had a pear tree, what would you expect to get on that pear tree? Pears. You got a degree in botany or something? Doctors? Oh, wow. Right. Now, is she related to you? Is she related? Let's, let's see how. If you bred rabbits, what do you suppose you would get? Rabbits. Wow, you got a degree in zoology? No. But you understand that, though. If you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. So wouldn't it have been something if, was it 1973 when Kim was born? That the doctor would come out of the around, congratulations, sir, you're the proud father of a baby girl alligator. <laughs> so, why was Kim a human? Because brother and sister Churchill are human. I mean, you don't have to, as I say, a rocket scientist to understand it. Everything brings forth after its kind. Whew, this is fundamental, but it's so important how people believe the theory of evolution when well, it's just a plain old lie and contradictory to scientific laws and it has caused any possible to lose their faith. Because somebody taught it as fact, and it wasn't fact. Okay, oh, wow. It seems like there's always exceptions. Always exceptions in there. I thought, for the moment, Paul, I thought you said that everything brings forth after its kind. And here, front page of that reliable scientific journal, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, it says here, Papa was a dog and Mama a cat. And the London pet shop owner who said he bred them now has two offsprings he calls dads. Roy Tut said he crossed a male Scotch Terry with a female black cat. The offsprings have a dog face and cat's legs and fur. 
said an oh, spokesman for the Regency Park Zoo, I would have never thought it possible. I thought you said that about a dog would have puppies and a cat would have kittens. And here they bred a dog with a cat. They got a dad. So my question is, who dad? <laughs> or, or how do you explain that? Now, is there any people who speak German here? Is it Voss's dot? Huh? Okay. Ah, okay. Well, you know, this was front page. Now, I, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't always read the paper, you know, real thoroughly, but somehow the Lord must direct me the next day, buried about page six or seven. Can you see this little article? This was front page. This is a little article. And it, said, it, it says here, Two furry animals and Roy Tutt offered as evidence of successfully mating a dog and a cat with nothing more than Mongol puppies. It cost him five shillings each by spending the equivalent of dollar twenty. Tut perplexed British animal experts to earn some money. Personal interviews, photographs, according to his handwritten confession, the whole business is a hoax. Just a hoax. It's like about every five years or so, somebody comes up with these. It always turns out a hope. You can't breed a dog with a cat. I have proved this scientifically. I've proved this many places in the lower 48. <laughs> okay, I've proved this in Chile. I've proved this in Brazil. I've proved this in places. I've proved it here in Alaska, the upper state. Thank God. What a privilege to be in Alaska. It's the first time I've ever been in Alaska. I'm just thrilled with it. Beautiful. People have been giving us some tours. So I've enjoyed it. But I think we'll find it true in, in the last year. Do any of you have dogs at home? Okay. Do any of you have cats at home? Two? Any have three? Any have dogs and cats? Dogs and cats. Would you stand those that have dogs and cats? Uh, dogs and cats. Brother Colby, don't be afraid to say that. I make a bite. Dogs and cats. Okay. Now, if you have, if don't sit down yet, don't always ask you to. All of those who still, who have dads at home, we remain standing. No dads. I mean, I, I have asked this question, you have scientifically observed no dads? I've asked this all over, not all over the world, but many countries. Okay, no dads. Why not? And, and again, I, my, my training is in physical chemistry, but I've been told that the DNA does not allow a dog to breed a cat. The DNA is different. The number of chromosomes are different. Okay. God designed each kind to remain separate. Now, I will admit there are variations in dogs. There are all kinds. Oh, not all kinds of dogs. There's only one kind of dog. They're all breeds of dogs, aren't they? Wow, we, Jane and I have been walking in the park here, and we saw a dog one day, and it looked different. Nice looking dog, but it looked different. We said, what kind of dog is that? They say, it's a Labradoodle. A cross between a Labrador and a Doodle. And then we had, a few days later, we saw another couple out there, a couple out there, and we said, what kind of dog is that? They said, that's a Golden Doodle. Golden Doodle, or something. A cross between a Poodle and a Golden Doodle. So, by... Selective breeding, they've come up with wire box terriers, collies, great things, and so on. By the way, how many dogs did Noah take on the ark? Did he take two dachshunds, two chihuahuas, two pekinese? No, he said this is two dogs. Where do we get the variety of dogs? By selective breeding. The long, long haired ones are the long haired ones, the tall ones are the tall ones, spotted ones are the spotted ones, and you know, eventually they've come and created different. Breeds, but they're still dogs. I don't know what, whether you've got a big football stadium here or something, but if we took all the variety of dogs and put them into a kennel or into a big football stadium, then we took all the variety of cats, and we quite a variety of cats, and we put all those cats in there at the same time, fed them with bread, water, food, dog food, cat food, and so forth, come back 10 years later, what would we have? Dogs and cats and dead cats, maybe some dead dogs and so forth, but I guarantee you, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, would never get any deaths. Because there's a scientific law, everything brings forth after its kind. 
uh, people will always come up and say, well, what about the mule? That's the horse kind. You know, you have a horse. You, you don't have a horse breeding an alligator. You got a horse and a donkey. Donkey, I pronounced that wrong. Uh, you know, it, uh, you know, a common kind of mule. Okay, but that's still you know horse kind. Okay, now I want to say this: there are variations. I have no problem with variations. We have all variety of dogs, size, color, shape. But when it comes to mic macro evolution. One kind evolving into another kind that's never been observed. A fish with fins have never evolved into an amphibian with legs. You know, a reptile has never evolved into a bird. Okay. So you don't have macro, but they've extended this what they sometimes call microevolution or variation of kind. Say, well, they have with a kind, then they can change from one kind to another. No. Okay. Now, third law. Am I going too long? No. Scientific law. Second law of thermodynamics. Systems left to themselves go to a condition of greater randomness or disorder. If you had parts of a puzzle and you had a huge fan here and you had boxes, uh, parts of a puzzle, even if you had it had it pretty well completed. You throw out the fan, and what happens? They go to disorder. And things go from order to disorder. That's what we observe, isn't it? Things go from disorder to order to disorder. That is always happening. Cars rust out, people get old, a whole lot of things. You know, yeah. Now, that's what the second law of thermodynamics says. But what does evolution say? Evolution says disordered particles arrange themselves in the ordered life. That's as likely as having a thousand piece puzzle or even a hundred piece puzzle, throwing up the fan, and what does it do? Complete the whole picture. You know that doesn't happen. But that's what evolution says. Disordered particles somehow arrange themselves in the ordered life. A contradiction to the second law of thermodynamics. Do volcanoes, and you've got a lot of them here, get I don't know how many volcanoes you got here in Alaska. It must be thousands, huh? Have they ever laid out city streets, sewer systems, and so forth? You know when they were up? Huh? Uh, you've never observed that, have you? Never repeated it? Never? How about the earthquake? You had a huge one here in 1964, didn't you? 9.2 in the Richter scale. Did that produce new buildings across the street? Always goes order to disorder. How about bombs? Bombs. Now, this is before most of your time, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, but uh, more familiar, you see these bombs, you know, even in Iraq and Afghanistan. Do they ever produce order? No. And I want to say no eruption, no earthquake, no explosion ever produced a skyscraper or anything else orderly. And to be fed that lie, that 13 to 15 billion years ago, a kernel of energy exploded in a big bang. And that produced an orderly universe, an orderly solar system, an orderly Earth, orderly life, an orderly man. You've got to have a lot of faith to believe that. Because that's contrary to science. That's contrary to what we observe. It's just really hogwash. Okay. Now, here's something I'm going to just I've got this kind of, it's not exactly order in the book, but these kind of fits. Mathematical probability. What's the probability? What's the probability that evolution could occur by chance? Well, let's try something here, if we could. Uh, By the way, the reason why this is important is I think this is one of the strongest evidences that to show that special creation is true and that evolution is false because of how mathematically improbable evolution could occur. Now, let's try something here. Uh, combination lock. How many in school had a combination lock? What's the probability? Let's say you had your iPad in there. That's become very popular. And you decide you're going to leave it at school. You put it in your lock. You put it in the combination lock. One of your, quote, friends 
sees you put it there, desires to have that, covets that. What's the probability of them coming up with the first number correct? The master lock. One in what? One in 40, right? The 40, you know, the master lock is 40. So that's one in 40. Then after they've gone, you know, a couple times they come to the first one, then they're supposed to go beyond the first number and then to the second number. What's the problem though they get the second number right? Again, one in 40. And then what's the probability after they go to the next number of hitting that next number? One in 40. What's the problem of getting all three numbers right? One in 40 times 40 times 40, and there's one in 64,000. If they did that once a minute, once a minute, 64,000 times, it could take them 42 days to come up. Well, it probably, maybe it wouldn't take them that long, but it could take them that long. But surely, that's 24-7. Can you imagine the next morning this guy's weary, he's still spin, spinning, and, and the security officer comes up, finds him, or the principal, or maybe you. Well, let's say they know the probabilities, that's why they sell a lot of master locks. Let me illustrate this a different way. Uh, let's just go through this here. Uh, the probability decreases as the number increases. Let's take the, the three boys of that one row again. You've been helping me come up with you three again. I have three numbers here. Five, an eight, hold it so they can see, and three. Now, you said beside him, they said, but so the number up there. Let's scramble these guys up. That was what, 385, let's scramble them up. Here, three, uh, three. We're going to move it there. We're going to go there with 538. And, and here we've got 583. So, okay. I want you to, to guess. I'm going to, I'm going to determine a, a number, a number here. And I want you to guess, see if you can guess the number that I'm thinking of. Okay, write it on your piece of paper. You have to try to guess the number that's in my mind. I'm afraid to whisper to brother. Churchill, because he would might, I may mean, say it's a little loud, and then I, I hear it. Okay. How many heard me say that? Nobody? Okay. Okay. Now I want you, have you written down what the number? What was the number, Brother Churchill? Yeah. 835. Okay, how many guessed 835? Wow, quite a few. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. The probability is one out of six that you'd get there. Because to get that first number eight right, you had a choice out of three, didn't you? So that was one out of three. Then, then you had a choice here of either 53 or 35, so your choice of getting the next one right is one out of two. And then after you've got those right, then what's the chance of getting the last one right? One out of one. So the probability is one in three times two times one. So it's one out of six, the chance. And that was about the right proportion. If we had a larger number, you'd find it comes even closer. If I had 10 flashcards here, what would be the probability of getting the number right? Well, it's one in 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 4 5 to 4 times 3 to 2 to 1. 10 for factorial mathematics. In other words, it's one in over 3 million. Suppose that we had a hundred flashcards. Now we don't have a hundred digits, hundred digits, but if we had a hundred different, say, Japanese characters here and raised them, hundred different ones, what would be the problem of getting hundred right? Well, it's one in a hundred times ninety-nine times ninety-eight, one in a hundred, one in a one followed by a hundred and fifty-eight zero. That's a huge number. In fact, Einstein estimates the total number of particles in the universe is 1080. And if you had this 10, these 10 to, 8, 10 to 80 particles, and if you had them had them rearrange themselves 30 billion years, which is the longest I've ever heard evolutionary did, and then they arrange themselves a trillion, trillion times a second, that would only be like 10 to the 112th, I think. So mathematically, it's improbable for 100 flashcards to be arranged in 30 billion years, the things arranging a trillion times a second. How about life? A living cell is 
far more complicated than 100 flashcards. You're wonderfully and fearfully made. The more they learn about the human body and the human cell, the more they realize anybody who's, shall we say, not willingly ignorant, recognize this couldn't happen by this time and chance. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, now, let's, uh, I've already said 100 components, 100 factorial, one chance, and 10 followed by 158 zeros never could happen. Now, what's the probability of life occurring by chance? Why is it a possibility? The probability of a protein is one, forming is 1 and 1 followed by 450 zeros. The problem of a living cell, 1 and 1 followed by 40,000 cells. Let's put it some, not so mathematically. It's more likely for a tornado to pass through the, what was it, Mitchell Airport? What's the guy's name? Is, is, is Anchorage, what was his name? Is that the, the airport? What? Stevens. I don't know where it is. It's more likely for a, for a tornado to pass through a junkyard somewhere in Anchorage and producing a Boeing 747 than it is for evolution to take place. Life. It's more probability, more probable that billions of blind men would solve Rubik's cubes simultaneously than this the life of a gem. Brother Churchill saw me with this Rubik's cube and what else gonna do with it. How many have ever how many have ever tried to solve Rubik's cube? How many were not able to solve it? I wasn't. I, I never had to solve it. Can you imagine a blind person solving this? Well, you go on YouTube and you'll find that some blind people, they, if they will tell, there's some blind people so intelligent, if you'll tell them exactly the pattern, they have been able to solve that. But if you didn't tell them the, the pattern, they couldn't begin to do it. Can you imagine billions of blind men giving scrambled, scrambled rubber cubes? You say, go and they all of them solve at the same time, that's more likely than life to occur by chance. It's more likely for it's more likely for an explosion in a print shop to produce a dictionary than it is for life to occur by chance. What I'm saying a lot of people have seen this. It ruled out evolution completely because they realized it is a mathematical improbability. And I say that's a mathematical probability so beyond doubt that when you ever see something complex as a living system, it was designed. It did not come here by time and chance. Without a living God to create life, life could never come into existence at all. I want to encourage you. And my website is free, doinggood.org. I'm getting over a thousand pages visit, thousand two hundred yesterday, thousand fifty seven pages visit. This is a tremendous resource for Bible study, for Bible games, Bible quizzes. You can see also you can also see uh, me teaching every chapter of my book uh, on here. Not see me, but you see the PowerPoint and the voice, it's just a whole lot of things. It's my life's it's my life's work. It really, because I haven't been on the internet that long, but it's it's fair for you. And also, also I do want to encourage you, those of you who can, they'll save me carrying them back on the plane <laughs> to get the, the book. Autograph I'll autograph them if you don't want it ruined. Okay, a uh, couple minutes. There'll be some people who are not going to be here next. Let me tell you what I'm going to cover, it, Lord willing, in the next couple of days. Tomorrow, I want to cover... Bible answers regarding creation. Friday night, I want to cover the fossil record. The fossil record says no. Dinosaur fossils, human fossils in particular. Sunday morning, Sunday school, I want to cover the age of the Earth. Is the Earth actually 4.6 billion years? Sunday night, uh, Sunday service, I'm going to talk about design and purpose and creation. Now, uh, I do like to offer, if some of you cannot be here, thank you, Brother Glover, <laughs> for being here. I know your schedule is extremely busy. Glad you came. And uh, I, I'd be happy to answer 
any questions. If I'm going to cover one of the other sessions, then I may just answer the question afterward. But there's a, somebody who has a question that's burning in their heart right now that maybe you're being in trouble with in school. Okay, a theory is an ex explanation why. No, I just say that's a theory. Evolution is a theory, and creation is a theory. Okay, now, the, ther the thing is, which is right? Okay, I would say that the evolution theory is absolutely false. You know, and it's a bad theory. The creation theory, now I just want to say this very plain, and I don't mind... Both creation and evolution are religions. Yeah. Neither are science. You know, they try to say they're, they're neither science. There's some people talk about creation and science. Creation is observable, repeatable, verifiable, subject to interpretation. You can't experiment. So neither creation nor evolution. But creation is something that, that just makes sense. It couldn't happen by chance. There had to be a designer. And that's what we're going to talk about Sunday morning. Is when you see something, you know, the, the old famous one was William Paley, and I won't use this, but he said you pass through a field, pass through a field, and you see a whole bunch of rocks, and you see a watch. There, there's a, you can recognize the difference between the, the, the watchmaker and anybody. There had to be a watchmaker, and it didn't just have much chance. And that's the design principle. So I think creation, that there's a creator, makes sense, but you don't do it simultaneously. I don't know if that helps you or not. Theories are explanation of why. Some are good theories, some are bad theories. Both creation and evolution are theories. I think creation is a good theory. And people will maybe think I'm blasting you by calling it theory, but scientifically that's what it is. It explains the why, how we got here, how the universe got here so far. And through faith we understand the world's the frame of the Word of God, not through science. Good. Anybody else? Well, you've been great. If I keep you too long, you may never come back. I hope you all come back every time. I really do. I'm, I'm, I'm burdened by this. I really want to teach this. I feel like it's essential. I want to see these young people saved. I don't want them destroyed. I don't want their faith destroyed in school. I don't want this young lady who's, who I could tell loves God, but I don't want her to go to university and get, get brainwashed by this falsely called. Let me just tell you this. I, I'm so thrilled. I got an email just this week from a young man, and uh, he had been to my seminars and read my book. And he, in college, just just Friday, he gave his class. They gave, they were to give a speech class, two paid, two speeches. It had to be the first one on things that uh, you had to present the neutral view, in other words, both the sides, and then the the second was the persuasion speech he presented, which was to where he took the evolution thing, and I. I helped him with the neutral side. You know, both are religions, and gave him a few points, and he gave that. He said that went very well. I got a whole lot of attention. And then, a few weeks later, when he gave his persuasive speech on creation, the instructor actually asked him, because I got some, his, you know, he said, are you going to be a preacher? And told the class that, you know, people need to consider the religious view. I had another fellow from Brother Booker's church in, in, uh, in uh, Rialto, and they have in their service a time when you go around and you greet people. And this young man who I had not met before, he said, I'd like to share something with you. He was in the anthropology class, and he told me, he said, in his anthropology class, his instructor, the very first thing he said, is one of my goals in this class is for every one of you to become an evolutionist. Well, what, what he did, this instructor had a, 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 on the computer a blackboard, a blog, or something like that, and he posted a link to my website of a debate I had with the chairman of the Northern Atheist. He said about 90% of the class, class saw that and agreed with my point. The instructor was so mad, he shut down that blog so that nobody could see it in his own blog. And you know what that student, he's driving there, you know, you know what he did the last day of class? He came up to give the instructor my book as a present. <laughs> You know what grade he got in the class? He got an A. Thank God for some young people who stand for truth. The other student who gave that speech, he got A's on both speeches. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Amen. This is truth. Oh, hallelujah. I could go on. You're just missed in Jesus. God bless the Churchill. What a great pastor and pastor's wife and family you have here. And, and it's just, I just enjoyed it. It's been good to be here. We have enjoyed it. Amen. Now we are, we are going to do something that wasn't originally on the schedule and that, but I feel like it's very, very important. I want to talk to you about the age of the earth. Because this, this is what the evolutionists have to have. They have to have eons and eons of time or the whole theory falls flatter than a pancake. It falls flatter than a pancake anyway. But it falls like a piece of paper. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, we covered, if you remember, the fossils. And this is one of the things that some people get fooled by. They say, well, we found this fossil in this fossil 70 million years old. So if the fossil is 70 million years old, surely then the earth has got to be older than that. Have you ever heard that line? You may always find it. Okay. I don't know if you've ever seen this cartoon, but this is, this is funny, but it's very true. This uh, guy, he asks the other guy, first of all, he says to the guy, this fossil is 3 billion years old. And the guy asks a reasonable question, well, how do you know it's three billion years old? And look at the answer he gives. He says, well, it was in this rock strata. Oh, well, how can you be certain of the age of the rock strata? And then he answers, well, this three billion year old fossil was in it. And the other guy looks kind of confused. And truthfully, this is so. Evolutionists date the rocks, or the geologists date the rocks by the fossils they find in it. And the paleontologists date the fossils by what rock it's in. That's called circular reasoning. And I want to say that's not the highest form of logic by any means. So this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is just sad. Okay, now... I mean, you go to a lot of places, and this is all over the world. Uh, Jane and I had the opportunity to go to New Zealand a few years ago, and we visited the, uh, I don't know if I can pronounce it, the Waitomo uh, Glow Worm Caves. And, of course, all the information was that these caves were 30 million years old. So we saw something 3 or 30 billion years old. Hogwash. <laughs> okay. And of course, you go in the cave and you see all these, these stalactites and stalagmites. I'm not enough of a geologist to know the difference. The one grows from the top and one grows from the bottom. But, uh, anyways, uh, so, but you know what? They have, this is a picture of a bat that was preserved in a stalagmite. Now, I say this either it was a mighty slow bat. Or else it doesn't take long for cave formations to form. Can you imagine that bat sitting there 30 billion years while that stuff dripped on it? No, it doesn't take long. Here's some evidence of it. it in a, uh, a, a, a railroad cave thing, I mean, that they dug underground, some kind of a tunnel, and they know, they know that they dug this tunnel like in 1850, and there wasn't these stalactites and stalagmites, but just because of the dripping soil, these things they know are less than 150 years old. So it was formed by the solution that found in an abandoned gold mine tunnel. I had railroads in uh, Australia. Okay. Uh, and so people have found out that caves be formed very rapidly, and it depends on and I'm going to get complicated right now, but the amount of carbon dioxide in the solution, the pH, that's the acidity. For those of you who are chemists, that's the negative logarithm, the hydrogen ion concentration. <laughs> okay. The oxidation of organic matter, uh, the temperature, the pressure, and especially the concentration of the solutions that drip through and the rate of the solution flow. And that's what depends on it takes. So if it's very slow, uh, you know, it would take longer form. If it's fast, it's going to take a lot faster. 
So caves can form in a very short time. Don't be led to think that that cave was 30 million years old. And so much for what's called uniformitarianism. We mentioned this the other night. I think it's very significant. Mount St. Helens uh, was a very beautiful mountain in Oregon. And uh, I used it in illustration of the energy involved to blow up the top. But let's go another thing. Uh, this is what this is what it looked like, as I mentioned to you, this is what it looks like before the eruption. And this is what it looks like as the, the day, this is actually a picture of the day before it exploded. And you can see that, you can see that bulge, bulge forming. And the, it was forming for a few days. And of course, they warned everybody to get out of there. And there were quite people that didn't heed the warning and uh, were killed by this. All right. Uh, this is May 18th, and the next day when it blew its top. And this is a picture of what it looked like after it blew its top. Okay? And I think I got some pictures here of the trees that were blown over by the blast. These all were floating in Spirit Lake. Uh, this is an aerial view of it. You can't see very well, but the whole lake was covered by trees. And what is amazing is some of the mudslides and the, the canyons that were dug out in days, you know, by the mudslides from this, this uh, eruption. Here's a picture of the mountain before, and here's a picture from the same angle after. And uh, here's some more pictures before and after. Okay, but what I really want to get out of this, is why it's so significant, is that it showed that great amounts of geologic work can be done rapidly. In other words, many geologists saw things that they thought would take thousands and millions of years, and it happened in hours and days. In fact, some people call Mount St. Helens a 140th scale model of the Grand Canyon. In other words, the canyons that were formed in just a short amount of time, this is the, probably the mechanism that uh, the, you know, the flood and some of the things happened. But it shows that things can be done very rapidly. Okay. Uh, so it helps on a small scale imagine what the biblical flood might have been like. Some of the effects, stratification, the layers. They could see these layers, you know, in the rock. It was formed in hours, and they used to think each layer was like a thousand years or something, and it was just minutes. The erosion, like those canyons dug out. The uprighted logs that were float, floating in the lake. You know, this way first, after a while, they floated so they, were, they would be, be vertical and then sink at various times. And that was... That's a good explanation for the petrified forest in Yellowstone, that they, you know, go down and sink. And they've gone under, you know, scuba dived underneath there and saw the plant on the bottom. And the peat layer at the bottom could have been the first stages of coal formation. So that's why it just shows things can happen in a short period of time, not as millions and billions of years. Now that we mentioned, we showed this this uh, slide. The basic theory of evolution is that you know several billion years ago, particles finally evolved the elements, and then complex chemicals, and finally man. As we showed this picture, uh, which is uh, good to you, that's their idea. But it requires huge time elements of time. Now. There are two major foundations that evolution rests on. And the two major foundations are what we're talking about now, time, eons of time. And the other foundation is chance. And Wednesday night, I think it was, we talked about the probability of life occurring by chance. And if you remember, we said the probability of life occurring by chance is less than a tornado passing through a junkyard producing a modern aircraft. Or we said the probability of life is less than an explosion in a print shop producing an unabridged dictionary. So what I'm saying is if we, if we took the time and showed you that, that Wednesday night, that mathematically evolution is improbable, so that is, what that is doing is 
showing beyond doubt that when you see something complex, like in living systems, you can be sure it was designed, it didn't happen by accident. And without a living God, uh, life could never come into existence. So, what two foundations does evolution rest on? Well, time and chance. And we took, as I said, Wednesday night, I spent a lot of time destroying this foundation of chance. And so that's one of the towers that's collapsed. Okay, now, today we're going to attack this Tower of Time. And we've already mentioned some things like cave formation. Now, probably the one you hear the most, when, I'm, when I do one session in church, which I do often, not a series, but I do some series, but lots of times I just do one session and it opens the question. There are two questions. Jane, you can vouch for it almost every time you're going to get two questions. One is, what about the dinosaurs? And we covered that, what night did we cover? We covered that yesterday, uh, Friday night, okay? And the other one is radiometric dating. And I say, what about radiocarbon dating? Have you ever heard that radiocarbon dating shows that the Earth is millions of years old? How many have ever heard that? Okay, well, the fact that, now let me just say right off, if you ever hear anybody say this, you know for sure that person doesn't know what they're talking about. Because even radiocarbon dating is not used to date rocks. It's used to date things where once alive, like bones or trees. So when somebody says radiocarbon dating shows the Earth is older, they don't know anything about radiometric dating. Okay, now, now I'm going to give you a chemistry lesson. Thank God our star student is here today. What is your name? I didn't catch it. Holly. Holly. Now you've had chemistry then, I gather. Okay. What am I showing here? And what is the periodic table of what? The elements. Okay. Now I'm going to give you a little chemistry lesson. If you remember, I took a piece of aluminum and tore it up and said the very smallest particle of aluminum has a property of aluminum was an atom of aluminum. Okay. Then that atom has a, a nucleus, a center, and in the center there are, according to the atomic theory, protons and neutrons. That's in the nucleus. And then there are electrons surrounding it. Now you identify, you identify a, an element by the number of protons it has in it. In other words, any element of carbon has six protons. And the element of hydrogen has one proton in the nucleus. And the element of helium has two. And the element of, of uh, any atom of nitrogen has seven. So that's called the atomic number. Okay. Now, when we get, this may be a little complicated, but carbon-12 has six protons. By far and away, all of the carbon atoms have six protons. But there are some that have eight protons. And that is like what we call carbon-14. Where do we get the carbon-12? You add six plus six, six protons, so six neutrons, it is carbon-12. Carbon-14 also has six protons. That's still a carbon atom, but in this case, it has carbon-14 has eight neutrons. Now, it turns out carbon-12 is very stable. That's what almost all is. But carbon-14 is radioactive, and it decays eventually into carbon-12. So that's, these two, these two, the carbon-12 and carbon-14, are both carbons, but they're called isotopes. One having 14 uh, weight, atomic weight of 14, with eight neutrons and six protons. And this radioactive isotope decays, given off some form of radiation. So carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope. Now, as I said, that is used sometimes to determine the age of bones and trees and things which are once alive. So they do have methods to try to determine the age of the Earth. And one of them is called potassium argon, Decay, and another they use is uranium to lead. 
And these are a couple of other methods. It turns out there is an expression which I didn't define yet. That's called the half-life. The amount of time it takes for a pound of carbon-14 to decay to a half a pound is called the half-life. And the half-life happens to be like 5,760 years, plus or minus 30 years. The time it takes for potassium to decay to argon, if you have a pound of potassium, the time it takes to become a half a pound is 1.3 billion years. That's a long time, isn't it? Okay? So uh, that's, that's what's called a half, half-life. Now I'm going to tell you why this is, how this is used somewhat. It's used to date then the age of rocks and sediment. Now, this slide may be a little complicated, but if you use this half-life and you assume the rate is constant, you can attempt to try to determine the age of the sample. And that's what they do. Now, here, here's the key. Here's the key. There are three, and you don't hear this. Most people don't know this. There are three major assumptions in radiometric dating. Number one is they have to assume that when that moose dies out there, and you know, if they're trying to determine the age, they have to assume that they know, or at least they found a bone, let's say a bone that they think was thousand-year-old moose or something like that. They have to assume they know what the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 was. It's when it died. And the uranium lead, they assume there's uranium, but no lead. Of course, that's a, a sad problem because they, they couldn't God have created lead as well as uranium. And then the other thing is, uh, okay, that, that's it. And the other thing is, they, they assume that the change in concentration only occurs by radiometric dating. But if you have some uranium or lead or some bones in there, can't some leach, the chemicals leach in and leach out? You're like acidic soil. It may be 98, 99% of stuff can, can leach out of it. So that's another poor assumption. But probably the poorest assumption of all is the rate of decay is constant. I said that carbon-14 decays. If you have a pound, it takes 5,760 years to use a half pound. Who's been observing it for 5,760 years? I mean, they didn't even think of radiometric dating until much over 100, 200 years ago. And, and especially there for potassium, when you date the age of the Earth, who's been measuring that a pound of potassium decays to a half a pound in 1.3 billion years? <laughs> I mean, nobody can assume that. Then there's no instrumentation that's accurate enough to even measure you know, anywhere near the sensitivity. So, because of these assumptions, you get some terrible errors. For example, they took some snails in New Mexico just just to experiment on this and dated with the, the shells and found out they were supposed to be 27,000 years old and they just, just took them, they were alive. Okay? They took some, some clams and found gates like a thousand years old. I think these were in Alaska, some sealed carcasses that they found 30 years ago. 30, they were 30 years old when they'd been dead. And they came up with dates, dates like 4,600 years, and then they took some living seals and killed, fresh to kill them in 1,300 years. You get some terrible errors. And, and then rocks. They, they have taken samples of rocks from this one place in Hawaii, this particular mountain that they know erupted in 1801, and they came up with dates of 160 million to 3 billion years, when they know the rocks were only 200 years old. But more more recently than that, I don't have a picture of that, you remember me saying that Mount St. Helens erupted May 18th, 1980. In 1992, these rocks were 12 years old. Somebody decided to take some of these samples to a laboratory that did radiometric dating to determine how old the rocks were, but they didn't tell them they were 12 year old rocks. And they came up with things like hundreds of millions of years old, and they were 12 years old. So what I'm saying, is they don't publish this. Every book, textbook in California has to say the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, and I've taken, 
I went to the school district and looked at the geology, looked at the, the uh, uh, earth science, looked at the biology book, looked at the chemistry book, looked at the physics. They all have that data because they have to. It's a requirement of state law that, that your books have to conform to this science framework. We have been hoodwinked because of a religion, a religious science, but a false religion, and it has been propagated upon our children and destroyed their faith in the B-I-B-L-E, the book for me, and as a result, our, now we've got, we've got just handfuls of believers instead of the whole country being a Christian nation. We've got more than handfuls, but it's, a, it's just sad that what's happened. So the conclusion is, I'm making is that dates obtained by radiometric dating, they may be an interesting geophysical exercise, but they do not determine the age of the Earth. How do we determine origins? We ask who? The one who was there, right? And he recorded it in what? The B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. That's where, this is reliable history. What I'm showing you, Pastor, that's science falsely so-called because nobody has ever observed the date of the Earth. Now, I, I, I don't know what's taught in the, in the schools here, but you would, I would doubt you get a lot of this evolutionary plan here. I'd be surprised if you didn't. Now, let me show you. If you take the same assumptions, for example, you take the same assumption of uniform rate of decay, there's a lot of things that would indicate a young Earth. In fact, over a hundred things, have been, I've got one article, 101 things that show, would show a young Earth. Unfortunately, you know, they take some of the same assumptions, but let's just talk about it. Probably, uh, for example, the Earth's magnetic field has been measured longer than radiometric dating, because it was, I think, Carl Gauss, and I forget what it was, about 1832, discovered that the Earth's magnetic field was decreasing. Uh, magnetic strength can be measured. You all have probably, and I haven't, I didn't look closely at Sister Churchill's refrigerator, but many homes you go into, you see magnets put on refrigerators. How many got magnets on your refrigerator? <laughs> okay, they got some there too. Uh, you can, if you want to, you can peel those magnets off, can't you? They aren't very strong magnets. But there are magnets which you can actually lift cars with in junkyards. So the uh, uh, strength of a magnet can be measured. The magnetic field of the Earth, the strength can be measured also. Not only does it, you know, no turn the turn the compass toward the north, but the strength of it can be measured. And they have found, and they've been measuring this. I think it was 1835. I've got my book. I don't remember the exact date, but they've been measuring that since since probably the longest thing they've measured as far as a geophysical type type thing. And th this is this chart here plots how it has decreased. De now, well, I, I have another slide and I've covered it up, but which showed shows the data that they have. They've only been measuring it since like by 1835. But they have come up with because of that curve and plotting at a logarithmic that it is decreasing in a logarithmic fashion, and it has a half-life of 1,400 years. So if you took that back, that would mean that uh, 600 AD, it would have twice the magnetic field, would have twice the strength. 800 BC would have four times the strength. You get down to the time, time of, of Christ, uh, before, uh, before Christ, probably about 30 times the strength. Okay, now... What that's saying, that wouldn't cause 30 times, wouldn't cause a whole lot. But if we had been here millions of years, and you were, which way is north of here? North of here? I'm confused. That way? So if you were chopping wood like that, <laughs> it would swing your, you know, your axe and swing that. If you're trying to sail a boat this way, it would go up this way. I mean, the magnetic field would be so strong. In fact, they have estimated if the Earth was 20, even 20,000 years old, it would, the strength would be so, uh, it would be, it would cause such heat that we couldn't live on here. So this is one, one, uh, thing that they use a similar type of something to show a very young Earth. Uh, another one that's probably more simple to you. How do you, how do you date a tree? Yeah, you count the trees, rings, don't you? Dendrochronology, big term, dendron, tree, chronos, time, logos, 
study. So the Denver chronology is a field of study that uses annual growth rings to establish dates. Now, what causes tree rings? In the uh, springtime right now, new wood is growing between the old wood and the bark. And trees grow rapidly, at least in some areas. Okay, in the summertime, it starts to slow down. And what happens in the winter? It stops growing. And then it starts again next spring. This is what causes the, tr the, the rings in a tree. So if I took this Douglas fir and I wanted to, you know, it was cut down a tree and I wanted to know how old it was, I just count the number of rings. That's not entirely accurate. Sometimes you can have an unusual spring where it gets real warm and then you get a real cold spell again. You can possibly have a couple of rings, but it's pretty close. You know, usually it's pretty close. You count, you get a very, very good estimate of the age of a tree by cutting it down and counting it. And uh, so here we have a case of a guy with a chainsaw cutting a tree and cutting the salmon. You get a pretty good idea, especially if you cut it down toward the bottom. So if you want to know how old that tree is in your front yard, just cut it down. But the problem is some people don't want to cut their trees down. So how do you date a tree without cutting it down? Well, it's very difficult. They have what they call increment borers, and they screw this thing into a tree, and they take a, a sample, and out comes a sample like a, a smaller than a pencil as far as thickness, and that sample, they can count the rings. But the problem is they can only go in about 12 inches. So you you're really, you're really have a poor, you've got to assume you know, kind of a uniform growth rate. So you really have a hard time with increment board determining the dates. So if I wanted to determine this giant sequoia's date, it'd be a little difficult. You can't, uh, because you can't just measure the diameter because that has to do with how much sunlight the tree gets, how many, much rain it's in the area, how many other trees are nearby that block out the nutrients and so forth. So the best way is to count the rings. Okay, now some trees are really difficult. They claim the oldest trees are the White Mountains in, in, uh, in uh, California, and it's a bristlecone pine. And you can see what a snarly, a snarly tree that is. Even if you cut that down, you, this one's called Methuselah, it's supposed to be the oldest, you know, oldest tree. Well, they're guessing at it because they haven't cut it down. In fact, you can't even get near it because they don't want anybody to disturb it. Uh, but anyway, at the oldest, you know, the tree, they somewhere 4,000 to 5,000 years old. And uh, it's interesting that if you take approximate date of the oldest trees, you come up with a date about the time of what? Noah's flood. And so we believe that this flood destroyed the whole surface of the earth. We think that the fossil, the coal, for example, is the fossilized remains of coal plants. So the tree, oldest trees, somewhat, you know, very closely approximate the date of the flood when most of the trees were destroyed. I think some survived. I, I, I feel like one must have survived because Noah, you know, when he sent out that uh, dove, came back with a leaf in it. But most of them were destroyed. Okay. Then the, how do trees survive? You know, how do they come back again? Well, the seeds and so forth floating and finally then settled and then reforested areas. It is interesting that they have found many places what are called polystrate fossils. These are trees, you know, where they've got layers of rock. Now, they used to think, well, each inch took thousands of years you know, before, before Mount St. Helens. But they have a real problem with this because if this took hundreds of thousands of years, wouldn't that tree have rotted in that time? This indicates that this tree is very red, that this strata formation took place in a very, very short time to have caused this tree to be going through many layers of rock. It couldn't grow through many layers of rock. You don't have a tree underneath the... Uh, 15, 20 feet of rock growing through the rock, you know, unless there's a crack. 
I also showed you, I think it was night, Wednesday night, that population statistics confirmed that man hasn't been here very long. And I showed you if man had been here millions of years, what would have happened? You would have been crushed, wouldn't you? Okay, so that, that confirms, uh, you know, younger. This isn't one of the 101 th things the guy in his article. There's, there's more than that. You know, evidence is for a young earth. Now, and if there had been no flood, you know, we started our, our calculations, we started with eight people repopulating the earth. Remember that was the eight and doubled to 16 and so forth. But if you start with two, but you go back another 1,500 years, and you started with two people with that same growth rate of only a half percent a year, we would have 2.5 trillion people on the face of the earth. That's 500 times the present population. Remember we saying that there was, if we had been here just 9,000 years, we would have 4,000 people per square foot? Now, if we had been here just, just the time since Adam, if there had been no flood, which they try to discount, we would have 500 times. What's 500 times times 4,000? <laughs> what, a couple million people per per square foot? Oh, now let's talk some other dating methods. You all are aware that of what's called the hydrologic cycle. And, uh, you know, you have the, uh, well, I guess you'd start, I could start with the ocean. The ocean evaporates, forms clouds. The wind blows the clouds over the land, and then precipitates as rain, or in some places snow, like Alaska, and then that melts, runs in the rivers, it washes into the ocean, and then the ocean evaporates. Greatest water purification system in the world, free. Okay, pure water evaporates, clouds, rains again, but what happens when that water runs down into the sea? What does that do as it passes through the earth? It what? It brings sediment. It also dissolves chemicals. You know, that are in there. Like salt and so forth, dissolves chemicals. So what's happening? The ocean is getting a lot more dirt in it. The oceans are becoming saltier. And they have measured the concentra concentrations of chemicals. And they have seen that sediment becomes. Okay, so so uh, what happens is the sediments, the, the, the ocean is sort of getting, you know, getting the layers of sediment are building up in the ocean floor. The chemical concentrations are increasing. And river deltas, such as, I think that's the next slide. This is an aerial view of around Los Angeles. And Brother Charles is from Louisiana, and he would he would, uh, you know, be aware of this. They claim that the Mississippi Delta is increasing one sixteenth of a, of a mile a year. In other words, what? Did I say Los Angeles? New Orleans. I'm sorry. Thank you. I got a good wife. She corrects me, and I need correct. New Orleans. I thought I said Louisiana, but maybe I didn't. Okay. Yeah, but okay. Tough. Los Angeles is in New Louisiana. Boy, I'm ignorant with my geography. <laughs> okay. Anyways, they this Mississippi Delta there near New Orleans is increasing about one sixteenth of a mile a year. In other words, about six, every sixteen years it increases a mile. Now, if the, if the flood is, you know, forty five hundred years, and divide that by sixteen years per mile, you know, 300 miles is not an unreasonable thing. But if we'd been millions of years, that delta would be millions of miles long. You know what I mean? So, so that's, uh, now, I, 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 again, that's assuming a uniform rate. Some chemicals, some chemicals have showed very young, and increases very little, very, like the very young earth. Well, that, that, see, these depend on 
what the water passes through, what's in the soil, and so forth. But anyways, what I'm saying, this type of calculation shows the Earth to be very young. Here's one. Uh, most of the helium in the Earth's atmosphere is produced by radioactivity in the Earth's crust. A helium atom, the nucleus of it, is an alpha particle. Okay, so that, when it, evolved, when it you know, passes into the Earth, it forms helium, helium gas. Now that again may be a little bit complicated, but if the rate of helium flow was constant, if the Earth would have been billions of years old, as they say, we'd have over a million times more helium in the atmosphere than we have right now. So the lack of helium in the Earth's atmosphere also gives evidence of a young Earth. Very little helium escapes in the space. It's in the atmosphere. This is one that, that uh, I just, I'm just i putting in my book when I'm revising it. And it's in the process of you know, updating it. It's Niagara Falls, because I think this is very, very under, easily understandable. They have... People living in this area have measured the, the, you know, how much, you know, Niagara Falls is sort of like a glacier, you know, in that you have ice breaks up and the glacier recedes. Well, Niagara Falls, because of erosion and so forth, rocks drop off and the Niagara fall, uh, Falls has been moving backwards and the gorge has gotten longer. Now, they have, if at a uniform rate, uh, if the uniform rate, which is, you know, they've measured somewhere three to five inches, uh, 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 five feet a year that they've averaged, you know, the, the falls breaking off, you're talking for a, a gorge being about seven miles long, you're talking again, close to the date of the flood. Not billions of years, but close to the date. So the fact that, that the gorge is not, is not, uh, you know, thousands of miles long, it's another indication, hey, you haven't been here so long. Okay. The coal and oil. I know we we were even taught in Bible school that the you know, after the fifth day or whatever the trees were thing and then took took uh, and that therefore the earth was very old. Uh, well many people think it takes millions of years for coal to form. But you know they have formed coal from cellulosic material have formed coal in hours in laboratories. There's a school, a school called Utah School of Mines that I have a document where they formed coal in just hours by the right combination of temperature and pressure. What could have caused that temperature and pressure? The flood. Same thing, oil. They have they've converted garbage and manure into oil in hours. You know, not saying that's an economical process. Otherwise, we might, uh, you know, we might use that rather than than uh, ethanol, you know, corn. But uh, anyways, what I'm saying is, again, it doesn't take a long time for coal and oil to form. And I feel like oil is the, you know, the remains of trapped marine creatures. What could have caused the pressure? What could have caused the temperature to convert to coal? You know the trees into coal and the and the uh, marine stuff into oil. Well, the, the temperatures and the pressures could have been generated by the friction and the pressure that were caused by the sediments of the flood. So that again is not an, a, evidence of an old Earth. Okay, we just mentioned give me a very very short time. Burial and friction resulting from Noah's flood can generate temperatures and pressures necessary to convert vegetable mineral material into coal in a short time, and oil likewise, and I've already talked about that. So, on what two foundations, I want to make sure I fit with your time frame, what two foundations does the theory of evolution rest? Time and chance. We showed that the probability of life occurring by chance is less than a tornado crossing through a gen passing through a junkyard producing an airplane. Mathematical probability of life occurring by chance, zilch. How about time? They need billions of years. We've shown that, that they do not have evidence at all for an old earth. So what foundations is the rest? 
absolutely nothing. I just want to say, what I'm teaching today is hated by evolutionists. Anybody who teaches a young earth is despised by an evolutionist. Because they know without eons of time, their whole theory collapses. Sad. How old is the earth? Well, remember we've shown when the first man was created? Do you remember that? What did we say the first man was created? About 6,000 years ago, and trying to drill this back. How did we get 6,000 years? We took the what? The genealogies. Adam was 130 years old and we got Seth, and Seth was 105 years old and we got Enos. And we added those up, got the, got the time of the flood, got to Abraham, got to Solomon's temple. By a combination of genealogies and history, we showed man has been here approximately 6,000 years. Okay. But what about the earth? Does the Bible give any indication of the age of the earth? I think I've got the scripture already on there. Jesus said this. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Now, what did evolution say? Remember we say, evolution say that the earth is 4.6 billion years old. They say man came on the scene about 3 million years ago. So you're talking about in the last Actually, one over one two one two five oh. Let's say the last the thousands period. They say in the last period, thousands per, period of Earth's history, man came on the scene. Did Jesus say at the very end of man's of the Earth's existence, God created the male and female? Yeah. Jesus said from the beginning. Amen. So it was at the beginning of creation that man was created. So how old is the earth? If, the, if man is 6,000 years old, I, when people ask me that, I say, well, if, if man 6,000 years old, then the earth is about 6,000 years and six days. <laughs> you know, but it's about the same. You know, it's relative time. But at the beginning, that was in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. It's six days he formed the earth to be inhabited. So when was the first man created? 6,000 years ago. When was the earth created? 6,000 years plus 6 days. Okay. Uh, let's stop. Take, this is a good time. We, you're going to feel more. Does anybody have a water for me? They could get me some water. I hate for the church I'll have to do it. But somebody could just get a... Here, Kim's got one. Great. Thank you. This is a good time, we got in Sunday school, a good time to ask you some, or to allow you to ask some questions. Thank you, brother. Thank you, thank you. Do you know of being converted? Yes. <laughs> John Greg is raging. Uh, Gary Parker, who is in Florida, he uh, speaks on evolution. He used to teach evolution, evolutionary biology. There's a, a, a tremendous video series that... Uh, Trying to think of the guy's name, but he took. Yeah, and, and he it's called Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. And he wrote a book, The Evolution of a Creationist. But he taught at a university and was teaching evolutionary. Actually, evolutionary dinner, he was in a dental school, one of the large universities in Louisiana. And the students came up to him and said, Do you know the assumptions involved in? And, and it was radiometric dating, and you know, what assumptions? He didn't think, but he thought, well, I'll, I'll check it out, and I'll prove his students wrong. And, it, and he claimed it took him about five years to finally see that, that 
Yeah, there's, there's quite a few. This uh, idea of the mathematical probability. You see, anybody who's honest, who is honest, you know, you can't even look at the stars. The heavens declare the glory of God. You can't even look at the stars and be honest and, and think that they evolved. You have to be, you have to be, well, let, I think, let me, let's see, I think I've got a next slide after this. Let me just see if I've got this, this second. Let me, uh, I think I've got, let me hear, oh, this is not it. Maybe it's not out here. Let's just see. Oh, cool. I guess it's not after here. Uh, I guess. Anyways, I was going to say, why do people believe in evolution? I think, first and foremost, they believe in evolution because they were taught by it. They were taught by it by somebody that seemed knowledgeable. You know, you get a first grader, a first grader, and if, if, if uh, if your wife was teaching first grade, the first grader would think, boy, she is a genius. I mean, you know, this, this lady knows everything. You know, so how could she be wrong? You know, she's teaching it. Now, I mean, your wife wouldn't teach it. What I'm saying is that's the way, it, you know, I think you were telling me about how the ages, different ones relate and think of the teacher. Well, then, then how, why did that teacher believe it? They sat in at some university. And we're taught it by PhDs, you know, with lots of uh, education and maybe good teaching methods. And so the most people believe in evolution because they were taught it. That's what most of them are. You know, I don't mean to be wrong or conceit or anything, but most people have not heard what you have heard this week. Have never heard it or never read it. Never even dawned it. They just accept it by fact, this evolutionary thing. And that's why, why I, I would like to see, I mentioned Brother Sister Groman teaches, I would like to see a hundred people in our movement teach it because this is foundational. What you do with Genesis, you can do the rest of the Bible. So I'm just kind of running on here, but Genesis, Genesis is a foundation for marriage. Do you know that? Very, very first, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother. Genesis is the foundation for modesty of dress. See, when they sin, they realize they need to be covered. And their idea of covering wasn't enough. You know, God covered, God believes in modesty of dress. I mean, almost everything you believe, the, the promise of the Messiah, the seed of the woman is going to bruise the serpent's head. You go through it. The Genesis is a foundation. That's the book the devil is destroying and destroying it in our school system. Okay? And the media. All right, the fossils. The fossil record. What do they say with regard to evolution? Well, they say no to evolution. Big no. <laughs> okay. Now, I've got a big word. I'm not trying to impress you with vocabulary, but I think you should know paleontology is the study of fossils. And if you ever hear of a paleontologist, a paleontologist is one who studies fossils. Now, what are fossils? How many have ever seen a fossil? Good, quite a few of you. What are they? They are the remains or traces of plants and animals that are in the Earth's crust. And uh, they could take a lot of forms, like this here is a fossil of a fern tree. Are you getting this loud enough? I can't tell. What, yes, good. Okay, good. Uh, fossils can take the form of footprints. Uh, I have, uh, I didn't take this picture, but I have been to Dinosaur Specimen Ridge, which is about 20 miles west of Denver, and have seen footprints of what they feel are dinosaurs. Uh, fossils can take the form like the top center there of, of a fish. I don't know if you can see that very well. This is quite clear, a fossil of a trilobite. This is some fossils and some bones So take that form. And then we're all familiar with the fossil fuels. Coal is actually fossilized remains of plants in times past. Oil is felt to be the fossilized remains of mineral, of, uh, you know, of marine life, fish, and so forth. 
Okay, so they, they're fossils. There's billions of fossils. And like, when raise how many of you have seen it? I think every one of you had your hand up and seen a fossil. Now, how are fossils formed? You remember the other night I said if you hit a squirrel on the way to church, don't expect to see a fossil? You know, because of, to be a, a fossil form, it has to be buried very suddenly. And it has to be buried not only suddenly, but it has to be buried rapidly, and it has to be buried uh, probably most of them by a flood, which covered the sediments, and these sediments, the weight of the sediment then buries the, the creature, kills the sediment, is deep enough to keep the, the bacteria from coming at it, and it uh, keeps the remains together. Now, fossils Instead of being, instead of being proof of evolution, really confirm Noah's flood, because there are fossils all over the world. There are fossils, as I mentioned, I think the night they have found fossils at the tops of most of the major mountains, indicating the the mountains were underwater. As I mentioned just a few minutes ago, coal and oil are fossil fuels, and coal and oil is found out about most places in the, the world. Uh, and I think I mentioned tonight that there are different kinds of rocks. Igneous rock is a rock that volcanoes produce when the, the lava uh, you know, hardens, solidifies. That's igneous rock. Sedimentary rock is that which is laid down from the sediments in water. And most of the rocks, in the you know, earth are sedimentary rocks, much more common than igneous or metamorphic rocks. Now, why are fossils important? Fossils provide the major record of plants and animals of times past. So if you want to know what an animal looked like you know, several thousand years ago, well, <coughs> We didn't have any photography several thousand years ago, very low artwork and so forth. We have descriptions of some animals in the Bible, but certainly if you wanted to know exactly what I, oh, what a goat looked like or, you know, what a tiger looked like, you probably wouldn't find that, you know, in, in the Bible. So how we find out about plants and animals times past is from the fossil record. And it really is the only direct evidence either for or against evolution. Now, the fossil record is an embarrassment to evolutionists. As we mentioned, the what, uh, what evolution is, is the idea that particles evolved into man. So, Pictorially, we think we showed this. This is what evolution tries to teach: that particles change into, you know, small sea creatures and fish and amphibians and reptiles and mammals and then man. Well, the reason why the fossil record is an embarrassment is evolution is if evolution was true, we ought to be able to find some intermediates between say, reptiles and mammals, or between fish and amphibians, or single-celled creatures to, to more complex creatures. We ought to be able to see intermediates. And, and the thing is, is that there are none. Do you know that, that Darwin, Charles Darwin, who wrote The Origin of Species, his chief opponents were the fossil evidence, fossil experts, the paleontologists of that day. They said, you have no evidence for your theory. And he realized that, but he thought that they would be found. Well, it's been like 150 years since Darwin's publication. Billions of fossils have been found, but there's still no evidence for it. So, if evolution is true, as I mentioned, we should find fossils of these transitional forms, sometimes called missing links, that are not there, not showing one kind evolving into another kind. So, the fossil record, instead of being 
a record of evolution is really a record of burial by water and it's contained sediments. Let's take, for example, one of the first steps in so-called evolution, the step between the single cell creature and the complex invertebrate of which I'm showing a trilobite. Hey, a trilobite is extremely complex. Compared to a single cell creature which is supposed to evolve into that, there ought to be some intermediates, but there are none. Okay? Uh, let's take a look at uh, at uh, fish. Fish are supposed to evolve into, fab, into amphibians. Well, if a fish has fins and a like a frog or something that has legs, there ought to be something in the fossil record which was like half fin, half leg, or quarter fin, three quarter leg, or something. Some intermediates there ought to be, but there aren't any. And of course, there's a lot of difference between fish, the way the pelvic bones are. Fish are not designed to walk. So the pelvic bones are small and loosely embedded m muscle, but on the other hand, the, the uh, uh, amphibian is designed to walk and its pelvic bones are much larger. Okay, uh, let's move on. Transitional form between reptiles and mammals. If a reptile is supposed to evolve into a mammal, there ought to be some intermediates. For example, if you will feel your lower jaw bone, you have one bone. A reptile has six bones on each side. And that's so that you know, a reptile can, can open its mouth real large and stink and swallow something a lot bigger and its mouth can open up like that. Well, if if a reptile with six bones on each side is supposed to evolve into a mammal with one bone in the jaw, well, where are the things that would have like five bones or four bones or three bones or two bones? You know, that ought to be in the fossil record. In our fossil record, we ought to have, why wouldn't they still be alive? The same thing goes with our ears. How many bones do you have in your ear? Three. I, I, I don't know the tech. I call it hammer, anvil, and stirrup. Do you know the technical? I, can, I forgot the technical term. But three bones in your ear. Do you know how many bones a reptile has in its ear? One. Well, if a reptile evolved into a mammal, where are the creatures that have two bones? These things, these things are, are missing and certainly showing that evolution didn't take place. And there are a lot of other differences. Of course, a reptile doesn't nurse its young, but a mammal does. That's where the name, you know, mammal comes from the mammary glands. We as mammals have a complex temperature regulation system. When it gets cold, we burn calories up to warm us up. When it gets hot, we perspire and evaporation cools us down. That's not so with a snake. Now, I, I, I have... This is my first trip to Alaska. How cold does it get here? That's the coldest it's ever gotten that you know of it, since you've been here. How much? 46 below. That's all? Well, it's got that cold in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. The interior gets colder, yeah. 50, 60. Okay. Okay. E either case, you've been here 45 below. If I'd have taken your temperature, so it was 45 below, what would your body temperature be? 45 below? No. It would be 98.6 degrees plus or minus whatever your average temperature is around that. And if I took your picture, uh, your, I don't know how hot it gets. It probably you probably have had days that got 90 here. And if I took your temperature, uh, temperature then. It'd still be 98 because if you get if you get uh, hot, you perspire to cool off. You're cold, you burn up energy. You're constant. It's a marvelous temperature regulation system. Yeah. Now, if we took the temperature of a snake when it's 45 degrees below, the temperature would be 45 degrees below the body temperature. It doesn't have that. What I'm talking about is there's huge differences between a reptile and a mammal to say one evolved into another. 
or either mammal or they even say reptiles, uh, you know, evolved into, uh, you know, birds. In fact, they try to say that, you know, what you see a bird is a former dinosaur. Isn't that hogwash? <laughs> All right. And then, of course, a mammal has hair and a reptile doesn't. So I'm just saying is, if one evolved another, there ought to be transitional forms and it's, it's missing. And then we have a diaphragm which enables us to breathe. They don't have. So these gaps, these missing links in the fossil record, they are really a real embarrassment to evolutionists. And creatures appear in the rock fully formed without any evidence of step-by-step -step changes. And as I mentioned, Darwin recognized this lack of fossil evidence, thought it would be found 150 years since then now, and billions of fossils found still no evidence of a gradual change from one type of creature into another more complex creature. Do you like cartoons? Yeah. I do. I, I had I had a wonderful pastor, Brother Spencer. His his name was Brother Spencer. <laughs> Oliver Spencer. And I, I, I think so highly of him. But he didn't believe in the funny papers. I'm just sort of glad that conviction didn't pass on to me. Because <laughs> I kind of like Johnny Hart, by the way, gave me permission to, to use these. And uh, this guy's going to go out and start digging, and he's digging and digging, and digging deeper and deeper. And his friend runs up, and he hollers, Eureka! His friend comes running, says, what have you found? He said, the missing link. <laughs> uh, uh. That's the only kind of missing links we'll find. Okay. Now, I told you one of the fossils we're going to talk about type is, is dinosaurs. And some people call this dinosaur mania. Kids love dinosaurs. I, I'm just not sure why. I don't know whether it's the monster appeal or what. I had the privilege just to... Uh, April last month to be in in Kaiser, West Virginia, and the the, the I think it was the pastor's uh, it wasn't his grandson but it was his brother's gr grandson. Somehow we got to talking, and I found out he had a bunch of dinosaur things. I said, "Would you bring them? I would be teaching on that Sunday morning. Would you bring your your dinosaurs with you?" I didn't think he had this many. But he came with these plastic tubs full. He came several of those. And we all, we put all the church was about this side. We lined up dinosaurs all across the thing. And that was only about a quarter of the dinosaurs we had. So he, he loved he loved dinosaurs. Uh, and kids are bombarded with dinosaur teaching. And it is probably the chief tool of evolutionists to brainwash children into evolutionary thinking. And I want to say that uh, it isn't just the schools. You know, sometimes we think it's the, it's the public schools. But there's many kids that are exposed to dinosaurs before they ever start school. And when I was teaching at ABI one a couple of years ago, one of the students worked at Walmart and he brought, the, and I would brought it except you to your limit on the plane, a dinosaur that was in the toy department, and around its neck was a little thing that said, this dinosaur lived 130 million years ago. You know, they were being fed with it. And I'm sure that's given mainly to kids before they ever start school. Some, some, uh, some ev leading evolutionists have said they got their start in their evolutionary beliefs by dinosaurs. Probably used more than any other thing to brainwash children on the evolutionary theory. Okay, so dinosaur mania. Let's talk a little about dinosaurs. First of all, I might say they've been used to sell a whole lot of things. I have here, for example, a Kellogg's Frosted Flake box. And it says, uh, I'll just show you the picture of it, you can see it better, but you won't be able to see the bottom part. It says, when you buy this, if you bought a box of 
of uh, Kellogg's Frosted Flakes is with, with the incredible mystery drawing list that's enclosed, you won't know what, until you're finished, what dinosaur will appear. Will it be a ferocious Tyrannosaurus, a flying Pteranodon? I can't even pronounce these, or some other prehistoric creature. It says, collect all four and surprise your friends. How many boxes of Frosted Flake would you have to buy to get all four? Well, you'd be, the mathematical probability is probably that everything on the shelf there is that same lot, you'd get the first one. So you'd probably have to buy a dozen boxes before you'd get, get four. And, and I want to say it's a, a great marketing tool because kids love it. They'll eat Frosted Flakes in order to get dinosaur things. Uh, Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi-Cola had, had this. It has, says free dinosaur trading cards until they go extinct. <laughs> okay. And uh, it says open up each 12 pack and each 12 pack would have one of these. Okay. And it says collect all 10. Can you imagine how many cans of Diet Pepsi, you'd have to buy before you can get all ten. I mean, the probability of, of you know buying ten, uh, twelve packs and there'd be ten, twelve different ones or ten different ones is so small. So, anyways, that's uh, uh, Pepsi Cola uses use that as a marketing tool. I have here, I have here Tropicana orange juice, and that's a uh, got pictures of dinosaurs on here. I've got here uh, vanilla dinosaur diner, dino cups. Even even oatmeal. There's oatmeal dino dating, dino data, and, uh, and so forth. So they're being used for a whole lot of, of things. And then there was a movie which was called Jurassic Park. Do you know that they spent some $55 million to produce the effects in there. Was it worth it for them? They sold 900 million, is it, is it nine, yeah, $900 million worth of ticket sales and over a billion dollars related things like t-shirts and mugs and so forth. And I think, I forget what Steven Spielberg or Spielberg, who, who was the, I don't know how rich he got off, he could became one of the richest men. And it was so successful, we were teaching in Michigan one time, and my wife went to Kmart, and what did they give her? They, they gave her a poster that's almost falling, falling apart here, and uh, I, I might be careful so it doesn't completely fall apart, but it was uh, announcing Jurassic Park 3. And they had another one called Lost World. So they made, made billions off of, you know, off of dinosaurs on it. And of course, they were, I don't know, they probably would have had more yet if it, people keep coming. So that's uh, the movies popularize it. Uh, McDonald's. This here is a, a thing that was given to 7 million school children in the eastern part of the United States. And... You know, people read things like that the earth started as one hot rock, it cooled down, rain fell, filled up the streams, oceans, the earth became green for a while, dinosaurs roamed the earth, but one day a meteor hit the earth and sent up a cloud of dust, blocking out the sun, this caused the weather, plants and animal life to change. Many years later, man appeared, which was that, many years later, which is it? man appeared, man spread all over the earth, they built houses, and so forth, and uh, th that's that's bad enough. But I want to I want to read what the text says about what it said here, and I've got a word for word. What seems to always look the same is actually changing every day. Scientists say that the Earth was formed 4.5 billion years ago. Since then, has gone through many changes. The Earth is still changing every day. Evolutionary theory being pumped on the public, and especially the children, uh, by McDonald's. And of course, you come there and you get the, I forget what they gave 
King, I think it was a Muslim guy, if they, the king. Uh, and then there was Barney. Now, I haven't watched Barney, but they say that Barney is watched by more children than even Sesame Street. And of course, that's again another influence of dinosaurs. And then another thing is the U.S. government. The U.S. government got in the act. Uh, I, I have the, the, I think that it's the top scene I have in my notes here. The, the top scene, I think, is Colorado. I think it's 75 million years ago, supposedly. They had like 15 dinosaur stamps. And uh, the bottom scene, I think, was Montana 150 million years ago. The U.S. government. By the way, we're supposed to have, you know, a separation of church and state, you know, so they try to argue those. We have a state-supported religion. That's the religion of evolution. It's a state government tax-supported. You go to museums, you go to almost any museum, it's supported by your tax dollars, and it's pumping people full of evolutionary ideas and thoughts. Now, uh, I had the privilege of going to the Chicago Museum, I think they called it Museum of History a few years ago, and they, I got this pamphlet and they got to actually see this, this thing. They spent $8.4 million for this dinosaur fossil. I had the privilege of teaching in North Dakota, uh, and in Bismarck, North Dakota, the capital of North Dakota, their state museum is right, right, uh, you know, next to their capital type of building. And they passed out, or it didn't pass out, they, you could pick up as many as you wanted, things like this. This is a coloring, a coloring thing. So any child goes through their state museum, gets these color kids, as many as they want, and you probably can't read that there, but it says, this Triceratops was one of the horned dinosaurs that lived in North Dakota during the Cretaceous period 65 million years ago. So this was the tax dollars of the North Dakota people. And you go to almost any state museum, you'll find that. Not only did you give away one, you could get others. Here was another one that I picked up while I was there. I can't even pronounce, I can't even pronounce this. Pleopithecarpus or something like that. That says here, one of the giant marine lizards called monosaurs lived in an ocean covering North Dakota about 75 million years ago. Pump full of evolutionary theory. Now, did dinosaurs actually exist? You know, I'm from Missouri. Sister... Churchill's from Missouri, the show me state. And I am I am one of these, I, I hope I'm like the Bereans that search the scriptures daily to see what things are going. And I have sometimes, I got, I got to wonder, you know, wonder, well, is this, did dinosaurs actually exist or is this just a figment, uh, evolutionary lie? Well, I purposely one trip, drove through Jensen, Utah, and went to the Dinosaur National Monument. How many have ever been there? My wife and I. <laughs> but we went there, and it, it was about, I think, 1990 we went there. But it's the only place in the world that I know of where they have a whole hillside of dinosaur bones, and what they do and you could, uh, on certain days, I, we weren't there the day they were doing it, but they could actually chip away at these these bones and expose half of them and leave, you know, you can see in the rest are in the rocks. And they have this this uh, a building building that uh, is all built over the top of it. Uh, so uh, this, like I said, June 25th, 1990, when we visit there, and these are pictures that I took, and I'm not a professional photographer, and I do not know Photoshop to doctor up pictures. This is actual, actual pictures. And this is a picture of a world famous paleontologist that was there. No, that's me in my skinnier days. 
Okay, I actually tapped on dinosaur bones. So, yes, I do believe dinosaurs did exist. And they have found dinosaur bones in every continent. I'm not sure about Antarctica, but every other one. Now, dinosaurs are called terrible lizards. That's what the meaning of dinosaur is. Now, a question you might ask, why isn't the word dinosaur in the Bible? You could get any concordance you want. You could get the uh, search on BibleGateway.com and uh, dot org, whatever it is. I use it a lot. It's, just, it's a favorite place to buy. But you could search for dinosaurs. You won't find the word dinosaur in the Bible. Now, if they are really real creatures, why isn't the word dinosaur in the Bible? The answer is very simple. Very simple. Why aren't cell phones mentioned in the Bible? Why aren't electric lights mentioned in the Bible? Why aren't computers mentioned in the Bible? And so forth. Why aren't they mentioned? Why aren't cell phones mentioned in the Bible? There were no cell phones. You know, when, doesn't mean that God didn't know about them in the future, but there were no cell phones. So the word hadn't been coined. You know, they coin about, they coin about 10,000, what is it, 10,000 words every 10 years? They add, add to, uh, you know, the, the uh, vocabulary. So what happened was, in 1841, Sir Richard Owens, when they were discovering all these bones, he coined the word dinosaur, which means terrible lizard. When was the King James Version of the Bible uh, written? Just recently, you probably know that they've had the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible this year, 400 years ago. Six, uh, 1611, dinosaur was formed, the bone, uh, the word, 1841. So it wasn't until 230 years afterwards that there was any such word. Okay, so the simple answer to why is the word dinosaur in the Bible is because the word dinosaur didn't exist, no more than cell phones or computers. Okay. But the Bible does have some terms such as dragons. You know the word dragons is mentioned at least 25 times in the Bible? Are dragons just old Hebrew folklore? Or did dragons actually exist? Yeah? I believe they actually existed. Okay? Otherwise they wouldn't be mentioned in the Bible. They have scriptures like their wine is as the poison of dragons. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the water some 25 times. So that is a term that's mentioned in the Bible. Another term that's mentioned in the Bible in Job, and Job describes this quite carefully in Job chapter 45, it says, look at Behemoth. He eats grass like an ox. He has a, moves his tail like a cedar. His bones are like beams of bronze, ribs like bars of iron. Only he who made him can bring him near the sword. Okay, now unfortunately I've got those pictures arranged just a little uh, out of order probably, but if you have a Thompson Chain Bible, a Dake's Reference Bible, if you do that, and you look at what are called the footnotes or the center notes, if you look at Job 40, Verse 15, you'll see a little A by it, and in the footnotes they'll have things like, some, one of them has, has elephant, and one of them has, instead of behemoth, it has in the footnotes, crocod, uh, hippopotamus. Now, the Bible describes behemoth as having a tail like a cedar. I'm not sure if a cedar trees grow here in Alaska or not, but a cedar is a tree. Now, does an elephant have a tail like a cedar? Huh? I've seen elephants, a lot of them. 
I had the privet. Does a hippopotamus have a tail like a cedar? I had the privilege of being in Uganda for 17 days, and, and the Royers took Sam and I on a two-day safari in the midst of our 70 days, and I really appreciate it, but we went up, down, we went up the Nile River, you know, in a kind of a, a boat, I think, and I probably saw thousands, literally thousands, I didn't count them, of hippopotamus. None of them had a tail like a cedar. On the shore, on the shore there were elephants. There were I probably saw several hundred elephants, you know, on the shore. None of the tail like cedar. No. Hey, hey, if you don't if you don't realize this, the Bible is a hundred percent inspired, but the footnotes aren't. You know, Schofield's dead wrong on a lot of things. He's absolutely wrong. By the way, the Bible sheds a lot of light on those commentaries, somebody says. You know, so don't trust what the don't trust what the commentaries they trust the word the creature the Bible describes behemoth had a tail like a cedar. Another creature that's described by Job in the next chapter and Leviathan is mentioned other places in the Bible is Leviathan. It says, "Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook?" Now there's some good fishermen in this room. One of them is your pastor. And things you catch with a hook are things that are what? In the water. I doubt whether you've caught many birds with a hook. You know what I mean? Or many mammals with a hook. So this one must be a sea creature. Now, you probably haven't used harpoons. Maybe you have, but what do they use harpoons for? You know, to spear fish. So this is a creature that, that uh, was apparently, or seems to be, in the water. It says, who could open the doors of his face with his terrible teeth, his rows of scales? When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. He makes the deep to boil like a pot, indicating that it was churning up the water. Okay, now, what were the dinosaurs like? Well, from the bones, from the bones is an indication of... I think that these were some very large creatures, some of them. Now, all dinosaurs weren't like that. There are some dinosaurs, I understand, no bigger than chickens. But there were some, obviously, some huge dinosaurs. From the bone, you could tell some of the size. From the footprints, you can also get some indication of size. They had some big feet, you know? Okay, there are some things you cannot tell. You can't tell about dinosaurs. What can't you tell about dinosaurs? What? Yeah, I don't think you could tell really about that, could you? Anything else? Huh? Yeah, you could tell about blood type. I was giving you something you couldn't tell what, whether blue, green, gray, black, brown. You can't tell about about uh, what their eyes or the ears or the muscles look like. Why? Those things rot away. Fossils remain to, to be like the bones that then became mineralized. You can't tell really whether they're warm-blooded or cold-blooded. Now, if they were reptiles, I'm confident they would be cold-blooded, but you can't really tell whether they were med vegetarian or meat-eating. Now, they, they all say, How? Oh, Mom, pa, T. Rex. I mean, T. Rex with their teeth and their claws. They tore up other little dinosaurs and they ate them. Where'd you get that from? Jurassic Park. You didn't get that from the Bible. They were. You remember me saying that one of the things different before the flood is that man and animal were vegetarian. I can't tell. I can't tell whether you're a meat eater or a di uh, uh, <laughs> dinosaur. <laughs> oh my, I better pick up Brother Hoffman now. <laughs> I can't tell whether he's a vegetarian or meat eater. He's grinning right now. He's showing me his teeth. I can't really tell. He, he you know, uh, uh, Brother Charlie, I can't tell whether you're a meat eater. You know, a meat eater or, or a vegetarian. Did he eat meat? Okay. 
<laughs> okay. Well, I, unless I, you know, saw some meat in, in his teeth, you know. But you know, a panda bear is a vegetarian. It eats, uh, what do they call it? Bamboo. Bamboo. And, and they have sharp teeth. And I dare say that any vegetarian person, you know, that's a vegetarian, they'll have sharp teeth. You can't tell that. I, I believe that Adam and Eve had sharp teeth. I believe that, you know, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah, and all of them had sharp teeth, but they probably sharper than ours. We have kind of dulled them down by chewing on steaks, probably. So you can't tell that. Now, here's a question people ask. Did, did Noah take dinosaurs on the ark? You know, if they were that large, did he take them on the ark? I don't think there's any question that he did. Because Job describes them on, in, in the Bible, after the flood. A pig one and a blue one. A, a pig one and a blue one. <laughs> a male and a female, huh? <laughs> okay. okay. And by the way, by the way, he didn't have, you know, we sometimes, some people really scoff at this idea of, of how in the world could all the animals fit in the ark. Now, one answer, of course, the ark was very big. But the other answer, he only had to take two of every kind. Okay? For example, he didn't have to take two Pekingese, two Dachshunds, two Collies, two Great Danes, two St. Bernards. He took two dogs. Dog kind. Okay? Same thing with a horse kind. People ask that you really talk about that everything big forth after his kind. One of the common questions people ask, well, what about the mule? You know, there's a horse and donkey crossed and brought a mule, but the horse and the donkey must be the horse kind. You know, a mule is of the horse kind. Uh, they have actually uh, artificially inseminated and created uh, what they call ligers, lion and tiger cross. I have some pictures of that. So what I'm saying is he, he, he didn't have to take every different variety of Dogs, because there's just two dogs. You don't take every variety, you know, Clydesdales on down on the horses, just, just the horse kind. So, so uh, yeah, there was room on the ark, and I think he took uh, dinosaurs. And another thing is, is that that they uh, he didn't have to take the biggest one. And we're going to talk about this in a minute. Reptiles continue to grow, so he could take the young ones. And Job describes them after the flood, so definitely there were some after the flood. There are dinosaur drawings. I'll show you a picture in just a minute. In many places, many places in the world, like Arizona, Siberia, Zimbabwe, they have found it, and they have found traditions, tales of dragons in many countries. So when did dinosaurs live? Well, I think there was... There was no death. They didn't die off before Adam because at, until death, my understanding of Romans 5.12 is that by Adam's sin, death came into the world. So man and dinosaurs must have coexisted. Now there is some people who claim that, that they have seen, you know, dinosaur footprints and human footprints in the same location. Many creations have hesitated on using that. But they have found human skeletons in the same Utah sandstone, and I mentioned drawings of many tribal artists. Traditions of many nations have tales of dragons. Let me give you some examples. Here is a picture of what's called a petroglyph, a carving inside of a cave of a dinosaur, and you can see that tail like a cedar type thing. That's not drawing a rabbit. Okay. Traditions. The Chinese every year have the year of the something. I'm not even sure what it is in 2011. In the year 2000, for the Chinese, it was the year of the dragon. Here's a picture of a 140 foot mock up of a dinosaur. They were marching through the, tra the, the uh, streets of Taipei, Taiwa Taiwan, on the year of the dragon. I was teaching on this in Wales. And they asked me, did you realize that the dinosaurs are on the Welsh flag? And I said, no, I didn't. And of course, I Googled it when I got home. And here's a picture of the Welsh flag with a dinosaur on it. 
You heard of the stories of Sir George and the Dragon. Well, where did they get those ideas? They must have had something in their their stories as they passed down from the, about dinosaurs. Here's one of the, I think, one of the, the most amazing evidences of dinosaurs and man coexisting. I have a picture here of an ancient Cambodian temple. They read, by history shows that this Cambodian temple was dedicated in the year 1186. So that's only like a thousand years ago, but some thousand years after Christ. This picture on the right is one of the carvings in the door. Where would they have get, got this idea of that tail like that and these these things on the top if somebody hadn't have seen them? Okay, now, how did dinosaurs become extinct? And I really should put a quotation around this because I, I really think there's some question about this. Now, let's talk about dinosaur extinction theories. How do the evolutionists try to explain, try to explain that the dinosaurs became extinct? I like this cartoon here because this show, shows it. Uh, hi uh, says to no, it's Ditto. Comes to his dad, hi, and says, what happened to the dinosaurs? And he gives the evolutionary answer. They think a big meteor hit the earth, kicked up a lot of dust, blocked out the sun, and killed the plants, and they all starved. Have you ever heard that idea? Evolutionists even tell where it's supposed to happen, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. I like what Ditto asked this. He says, why isn't everything extinct then? And his dad says, uh, 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 I don't know. So he walks away and tells his sister, I'm getting smarter. I get him to say, I don't know a lot quicker. <laughs> Pretty good question, though. If they were supposed to cause the dinosaurs to become extinct, why didn't the deer and the rabbits and everything else become extinct? This is a... Uh, Gary Larson's idea of how dinosaurs became extinct. Well, smoke is harmful, isn't it? <laughs> I don't say that's how the dinosaurs became extinct, but that's as good a theory as this asteroid hit the Earth. Okay. Here's a Johnny Hart again, and uh, he's drawing a cartoon of a dinosaur crossing a frozen lake, and he is followed by the fat lady. Now the fat lady is pretty heavy and she falls through the ice. And the dinosaur bobs with the cat laughing because she fell through the ice. Now if you've ever read DC cartoons, you know what the fat lady does to the reptiles that make fun of her. And that's the true story of how dinosaurs became extinct. Uh, <laughs> I don't really believe that. But I think that's probably as good, he says, this is as good a theory as the evolutionists have. And here's Coleman's theory. The male dinosaur says to the female dinosaur, that dress makes you look kind of fat. <laughs> well, you could draw your own conclusions from that. I won't say that in the mixed audience. Okay. Now, how about a biblical, how about a biblical explanation. If they did become extinct, remember on the second day, God divided the waters from the waters. We mentioned that things were a whole lot different. A whole lot different before the flood than after the flood. Now how did, how could that possibly have accounted for the extinction of the dinosaurs? Remember, the flood one of the sources of the water was the windows of heaven were open. This, what I call water canopy, I think collapsed during the flood. That's one of the major sources of the 40 days of rain. Well, remember me saying things that were different before the flood? Remember men lived long ages, warm uniform climate? Men, uh, and I think, I really believe that if man lived 900 some years, I believe that the, the uh, other animals would have lived long time. 
In fact, they claim even now that reptiles do not, uh, you know, do not stop growing until they die. So if man lived hundreds of years, perhaps the reptiles lived hundreds of years. Now, I have read where an adult elephant, adult bull elephant, eats from 300 to 600 pounds of food a day. Now, I've never fed an elephant, but I did go to the San Diego, what do they call wild animal park, and I did ask one of them, and then they confirmed, yeah, they eat a lot of food. Now, if an elephant, say, ate 500 pounds of food a day, dinosaurs, 20 times the size, would have probably eaten 10,000 pounds of food a day. That's, that's uh, what, five tons? Now, they didn't have, somebody didn't have to feed them, you know, they did, but with a warm, uniform climate, lush vegetation, it probably was no problem. After the flood, I think it would have been, been a problem. Okay, but I mentioned how the dinosaurs become extinct there are pictures. Now, this here is an actual picture taken of a creature that was caught in the Republic of Congo, July 5th, 2003. Now, if you look at that creature and you compare that picture to this picture, this was done in the 1990s. You know, this is one of these things from the from the Pepsi Cola trading card, done some 13 years beforehand. It's amazing the similarity. Isn't there a similarity between this actual picture and this drawing? So, is it possible that this what they caught, what they caught was really, really a dinosaur that had yet grown to the size of you know, a dinosaur that was in, you know, that, would, that we have fossil records of. If you look at this at the rear end, it's tail like a cedar. And this is some, some form of crocodile. So I guess the point is, is that, and I, and I might say this, in the United States Church, there's only just a few of us that are teaching, traveling teaching, and, uh, I'm trying to think of the name, the name the fellow who he and his wife they travel. What Groman, Steve David Groman, and he's a definite believer that that these reptiles and so forth are just miniature dinosaurs, and I can't really find fault with that idea. So, conclusions regarding dinosaur bones, the fossil graveyards of dinosaurs all over the world. What, what I'm saying here, dinosaurs are used by evolution to brain people about evolution. We can turn it around and say, yes, there were dinosaurs. The fossils have been found all over the world. That gives evidence of a worldwide flood, confirming the Bible. Secondly, dinosaurs, you know they have found fossils in Alaska, cold climates? That gives evidence that what we would predict that before the flood with the, with the water canopy, there was a warm, uniform climate. They have found fossils, I understand, of palm trees here in Alaska. You all know more about that than I do it. I'd like to know more. So, a third thing, the change of climatic con conditions, if they did become extinct, they certainly is probably the best explanation, certainly better than some meteorite strike in the Earth 65 million years ago. And last but not least, don't let anybody laugh at you and say, ha, ha, you believe this book? It talks about dinosaurs, dragons. I mean, it talks about, the, well, yeah, there were dragons. Okay, dragons that we call now probably dinosaurs and Leviathan and Behemoth. Now, let's talk about the second major, major category of fossils that I think are very important to us. That is the fossils of humans. We showed this picture, I think it was last night. What about the origin of mankind? Is there fossils to show, you know, maybe what the first man looked like? Now, I just want to say before this that 
I'm not against all evolution. This is one kind of evolution I believe in. This is what some of you look like when you got married. This is what some of you look oh, I shouldn't say that. You're, you're probably here. Okay. okay. Well, we, we, all have, we all have evolved, but we're still the same species. We haven't changed. We haven't changed. Okay. Anyways. Now, it's really interesting that some leading, leading evolutionists have admitted now, Dr. Derek Eager, and Dr. Derek Eager was the former president of the British Geologic Association. Here's what he said. He said, practically every evolutionary story that I learned as a student has now been debunked. And yet, they're still being taught in textbooks today. I've been... It just amazes me in the question and answer sessions. I, I was with Brother Libby in April, but I was also with him a year ago before that. And one of the students asked me a question. And I said, I said, about the recapitulation theory. And I said, where did you get that? And it was from their college course in Texas. And that has been debunked for over 100 years. Still in textbooks. The idea of horse evolution debunked. Long, long time ago, still in textbooks. That to, and and uh, so practically evolution. And I'm going to show you some evolutionary stories that that have been debunked. First of all, let me tell you, I have in here, I have it here in this little thing. And you wouldn't be able to see it, but I have it here a tooth, a tooth that I obtained in in uh, October of 2000 in rural Tennessee. Now. Can you draw, with just finding a tooth, can you draw the creature that that came from? Now, I've had a lot of fun with this among students. I've had them try to draw what creature it came from. It's really interesting the different creatures that people have drawn, thinking what it was. You know, draw deer, rabbits, a whole lot of things. Well... I have an advantage. It was my brother's wisdom tooth. <laughs> so I know what it came from. But if I had just drawn that, I could come up with all kinds of ideas what it was. Now, a reason I said that for a purpose. Nebraska man. Have you ever heard of Nebraska man? It's called Hesteropithecus hero cookie. Well, where did he get hero cookie? Because they the uh, field geologists that found found this first item, this fellow's name was Harold Cookie. What they found was one tooth. They were so excited. It was in Nebraska, and that's why they called it Nebraska Man. They were so excited they had found the first evidence of anthropoid apes or early humans in the United States. They were so excited. They sent this tooth to the Smithsonian Institute. And from that tooth, well, first of all, I'd say four and a half years later, they dis they discovered what it was, was a tooth of a wild pig. But from that tooth, they drew drawings like this. You see the two cavemen type people? From that one tooth, that's what they said. They were so excited. This this was drawn by an English person, and it was spread around the world. Have you ever, have you ever heard about the monkey trial, the famous scope trial in, in 1920s? This is the kind of evidence they had. Almost all of it has been debunked, and yet that completely changed the educational system in the United States, the public educational system. And these type of things perpetuate themselves in textbooks for years to come. Piltdown Man. Piltdown Man was found, and by the way, back here, somebody said that if from one tooth they drew two creatures, if they'd have found a jawbone, they could have drawn a yearbook. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, Piltdown Man. This was found in 1912 near Piltdown, Sussex, England. Uh, they, had, uh, they had a broken fossil skull and a jaw, and like I said, they found it in 1912, 
But they kept it from what they called unfriendly inspection for over 40 years. But this was supposed to be early evidence to, of, of what's called Piltdown Man. It wasn't until 1953, over 40 years later, that a fellow by the name of Kenny Oakley was able to examine it under the microscope. He found that it wasn't the same species. He found out that the he provided an inspection microscope that these teeth had been filed and chemically treated to make them look old, and yet this was evidence for 40 some years that was used to show evolution. Hogwash, right? Hogwash. Lies. Whole thing was a hoax, and most every other one of them have been hoaxes, but not the, not necessarily retracted from the textbooks. Neanderthal man. You ever heard of Neanderthal man? Neanderthal man. Neanderthal man was in Neander, Germany, 1856. The creature they found, the partial skeleton, indicated it had some kind of a stooped stance, head set a little bit forward. But they now are, are convinced that it was fully human and probably suffering from some kind of bone deformities that may have caused, been caused by disease. They had a wrestler by the name Maurice Tillet. He was from France. He uh, wrestled under the nickname the Angel. Isn't he pretty? From what I have read, there were some anthropologists from Harvard who were watching him at a wrestling match in Boston. And they began to talk it and say, this man looks like a Neanderthal man. And they invited him to take some, some measurements. And they measured him. And his measurements fit the Neanderthal man description. But he wasn't some part eight, part man. In fact, he, he was a cultured individual, knew five different languages. I'd like to say that there are people today. Uh, I was at a general conference one year, and a good friend of mine invited us to eat with them, and he had invited a, a one of our ministers. And I'm not trying to make fun of him. I won't, I won't describe where it stayed or what. But he, he had features like a Neanderthal man. He was suffering from some kind of you know, overfunctioning the pituitary gland or some things like that causing bone deformities. So what did the first man look like? You already know that. To cover it. First man, did he look like Ramapithecus on the left? Did he look like Australia Pithecus? No. We've already mentioned the first man looked like who? Jesus. Adam was made in the image of God. Jesus expressed the image of the person. Jesus, the image of the visible God. Christ, the image of God. The figure of him that was to come, Adam, looked like Jesus, not some ape man. Now, uh, I've had the privilege of being in Bible college work for many years, full-time. I've left full-time Bible college work in 1999. I do go four weeks a year in St. Paul and teach in one of our Bible colleges. But when I was full-time, a number of times I was academic dean, different schools. And my responsibility was the graduation. And one of the things that I really didn't enjoy this task, but it was to fit the students with caps and gowns. Now, now they have a kind of a one-size-fits-all, but it used to be we had to measure their cap size. When I went to CLC in 85, to select college, there was a student there who had, I think, the biggest head I've ever seen. And uh, we measured him. I don't think he was still there, Sharon, when you were there. But the next fellow, again, I won't mention name, in, in later, a few years later, he had a head that made the first fellow's head look small. <laughs> See, I don't know if you remember or not, but his, 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 his he, we could not get a cap big enough for him. His mother had to cut the cap, sew some blue material in the back so he could wear a cap and gown. Now, my question is this, and we had 
there's quite a variety in adults in head size. I don't know what your cap size is, but I think what mine was about seven. There are people who have cap size, like, and then people don't even know what cap size is now because they have these things in the back that attach, but they're like six and eight, six and three eighths, six and five eighths, seven, seven and a quarter, seven and three eighths, even eight, eight and three eighths. And then there's big guy number one and huge head number three. If I had a table, like a table back here, and, and then if I was a cannibal or somehow had the fossils of all the former graduates, and I lined up some skulls here with the littlest one here and the next bigger one here, the next big one here, and at this end of the table, huge head number one and monstrous head number two, does that, does that prove evolution? Head size? Does brain size prove evolution? You know, that's what I did evolutionists say. You could tell tell by brain size. No. I dare say, uh, and I'm not making fun, but even in this room there are different different head sizes. Uh, and I won't point out some, but some of you have smaller heads and some have larger heads. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're more brilliant than the person who has a smaller head. You know what I mean? I, I just don't, that, that's just some of these ideas that evolutionists have are, are nonsense. So that wouldn't show revelatory pattern. It just showed a clever arrangement of skulls, wouldn't it? Now, you can't tell some things from bone fragments of teeth. We've already mentioned that regarding dinosaurs. So you can't tell. If you found a fossil of a human, you can't tell what the ear looked like. You can't tell what the mouth would look like. You wouldn't be able to tell what the eyes looked like. You couldn't tell what the nose looked like. You couldn't tell what the hair looked like because that's all gone. You can't tell the muscle or skin fat. So what do you see in the textbooks and museums? They are the result of a person's imagination. Now when we moved to San Diego, they have a tremendous system of museums in Balboa Park. And one of them is called, I think it's the Museum of Man, is it not? What? And, and when we first went there, it was kind of interesting. I went to the museum. Have you seen pulpits that are all plexiglass? Well, what they did was they had some like that in front, all these hairy creatures. You've seen these. They're not statues. They're hairy, hairy. I don't know what you'd call them. They're not dolls, but they're they're all these creatures. And what they did was they lined up, all the kids who marched by, you know, they show evolutionary history. And they have these hairy creatures, and some of them are actually embarrassing. But the thing I really had to, had to commend the San Diego Zoo for was on that plexic, plexiglass thing in front of it, they showed the evidence in each one. And there might be a tooth on this one, a little fragment of bone on this one, and so forth. And I thought, well, at least they're, at least they're being honest, and they show they had practically no evidence whatsoever. <laughs> you know, from a little piece of bone or tooth, you can't tell. But you know what, back there a few late, years later, they removed all these plastic things. And so every kid who goes to or through by the teachers, that this is how the first man looked like, and they're fed this evolutionary junk. Lie. And, and not even showing the evidence. You know, all the evidence, Lucy on down and so forth, they, they took all the evidence of human, so-called human evolution, which most of it has been doubtful and, and, and questionable. You could fit it all on one table. There's a little bone here. But yet, yet they're taught that evolution is fact, that man evolved one word. It's, it's sad. And it's, don't tell how many people's faith is destroyed. In it, 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 I mean, I, I, I thank God for each of you, you know, are here, but it, it's so sad that we are not able to get this message across to every single person we see on. I don't know, I don't know what the, what the answer, answer is. Okay, there's no such thing as ape men. There's fossils of apes. There are fossils of men, but very few. Men have always been men, 
And apes have always been apes. As somebody said, and there's some professors who fooled around with the evidence. Okay. Now, just one little slide here on the significance of the reason why I'm going to say this is that fossils, one of the big things about the fossils is that it gives evidence of Noah's flood. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. And if we aren't, it's just amazing the things that are happening. When the what was it? The, was it 19, 1991, September 11th, when, when they hit that, that, that Twin Towers? And uh, I, thought, I thought of Noah's day. The Bible says in Noah's day, the earth was corrupt and filled with violence. And it has gotten more violent ever since. And I'm not a prophet, but I would not doubt it's going to get worse and worse. And then when you think of the flood, that tsunami that broke up the tsunami and caused that, uh, that the underwater earthquake caused a tsunami that, that hit Japan you know, a few months ago, I think there were thousands of those under the water. That's what the fountains of the deep broke up. So the flood, Noah's flood, helps us to understand, hey, these are signs and I don't I, I agree with you, no man knows the day or the hour, but uh, there's such a thing as knowing the season and recognizing the sign. Peter said, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, and it happened. And I thank God that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If there's somebody here who has not repented of your sins, I've been baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins and have not received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's for you. God doesn't want you to perish. Thank God. Jesus, I'm so glad, Lord Jesus, that the Word of God is true, that we can believe your Word. Thank God that we have the Word of God that tells us what really happened, that we can ask you, the one who was there, and you can point us in the scriptures and they can speak to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. Amen. 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 The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.